And the meeting is now recording and live on YouTube. Okay. Uh, welcome back, council colleagues. Uh, this is round two, if you will, of um, our opportunity to hear from individuals or organizations who submitted a committee grant uh, request in advance of budget 2022. So it's my pleasure uh, to uh, call the meeting to order. Of course, we just have one singular item on the agenda and that is the community budget request presentations. So I'm gonna look for a mover and a seconder, please. Thank you, Council Barkley, Councilor Strachian. Welcome back, Councilor Strachian. And I'll call the question unless there are any concerns about the agenda. Uh, Councillor O'Sullivan has sent her regrets. She's not able to be with us, but uh, says she'll watch uh, the proceedings later. So calling the question, all in favor? Good, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, disclosures of interest, colleagues, any disclosures in regards to the 10 items on the agenda in terms of the presentations? I see none, great. Okay, so then we can proceed straight to presentations. Just a reminder to our guests, of course, thank you for being here. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Uh, we ask you to stick to five minutes as much as possible, which will give us an opportunity to ask uh, you some questions. And if any, if last night was any indication, there's no doubt uh, that um, we will likely uh, have our curiosity peaked in terms of some of the details of what you're presenting. So we look forward to some dialogue and back and forth. Our first presenter this evening is Mr. Tim Hamilton. Welcome, Mr. Hamilton. And Mr. Hamilton represents the Seaway Surge Baseball Club. So over to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Your Worship, uh, members of council, thank you very much for taking a few minutes to hear from us. Uh, I will keep this brief as I understand I have five minutes and we have two requests to put on the table to you tonight. Uh, just as a way of giving you a little bit of background, the, the 22nd history on the Seaway Surge is that we were formed in 2015 uh, by ex-members of the Kempfield Little League to provide um, competitive baseball to uh, young men and women in, in our area. Uh, next slide, please. We are a Baseball Canada, Baseball Ontario affiliate, which means we are run out of a, we are a Canadian operation. We are not uh, run out of the United States. We are a wholly Canadian operation. Our catchment area is basically most of Eastern Ontario, south of Ottawa to the Quebec border and west to uh, Kingston. Uh, in 2021, this past season, we fielded 14 competitive teams, which is roughly 175 players. Now, uh, as way of context for our first request, what also happened in 2020 was that the little leagues in our area effectively collapsed um, for, for a number of reasons. And we, the Seaway Surge, took over responsibility for house league baseball programs in our catchment area. Um, which means that this year we had 575 young men and women registered in uh, House League Baseball with us, which brought our total registration to about 750 players. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. So our first request uh, evolves out of this situation. Um, Riverside 2, uh, which is the diamond in the back left corner of Riverside Park, was built, I believe, in the 1990s, and it was built to little league specifications, which means that the base paths were 60 feet long, um, and, which was fine for the time, except that without little league now, uh, Baseball Canada teams play on uh, base, um, small fields with base paths of 65 feet. So effectively, what you have now is uh, a requirement that our players run up the base paths and out onto the grass before they reach the bases, which is leading to a number of problems, not the least of which is that we had reports of um, multiple minor injuries, mostly abrasions, some sprains as kids, as our players uh, tripped or slipped as they transitioned from the base paths to, um, to the grass. Um, and in our case, on that diamond, that's basically players from ages seven to 11. So pr pretty young, pretty young players. Um, this, this, I mean, this had, this uh, elicited a, a quite a bit of concern from our parents. Um, again, these injuries were minor, but, but, but sprains and, and abrasions nonetheless. And so we, we heard quite a bit of feedback from our uh, uh, membership this year about the fact that, that this was uh, problematic. So 
Uh, next slide, please. And as you can see in this diagram, this is basically what we're dealing with, um, um, especially between first and second base, second and third base, where kids are actually running left foot on the base paths, which is a, a which is a gritty uh, brick dust, um, and and right foot on on the grass. So it, it's this, you can understand to some degree why this is leading to to uh, problems. Next slide, please. Our proposal to council is that uh, we would like to rebuild uh, the infield to Baseball Canada standards. So in other words, other words lengthen the base paths to 65 feet, uh, which means cutting out a bit of the uh, grass in the outfield and laying in extra fill for the base paths. Uh, we'd also like to replace that fill, which is there now, which, as I said, is, is brick dust with proper baseball clay. The point being that baseball clay actually cushions the impact when someone falls and so provides a much safer uh, um, bedding for, for our players to play on. Uh, we'd also like to insert magnetic breakaway bases to prevent uh, people from uh, young players from spraining their ankles when they hit the bases. At the moment, they're staked in with, with three foot stakes, which means there's no give on the base whatsoever. So if a seven or eight year old hits that base properly, they can quite easily sprain their, sprain their ankles. The cost that we've received, and this is a cost uh, estimate generated by uh, North Grenville's Parks and Recreation Department, is that it would be about $8,000 to perform this upgrade. Um, and because we like to partner with uh, municipalities on these things, we would be prepared to commit about $3,000 to this project if, if um, council decided to go ahead with it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, a request number two uh, is a slightly bigger project. Um, we use the uh, large diamond. The large diamond at South Gore Park is the one that's in the back of the of the park. It's the 6090 diamond. We use that diamond every night of the week and pretty much every weekend from May through to almost the end of October. Uh, last the last count we played over in this past year, we played 150 games and roughly the same number of practices on that field. Uh, in our area, it's the most used large amateur baseball diamond. We don't use any other diamond in either North or South Dundas or Brockville as much as we use South Gore 3. Um, and um, for those of you who have been on council for a while know, since 2014, when we had the Little League Junior Championship there and, and invested roughly $75,000 in the field, we've been constantly upgrading it. And I think it's fair to say it's now probably the premier big amateur baseball diamond in Eastern Ontario. But that is not to say, well, and I should also say this year in 2022, as we return to some some concept or normality, uh, we will be returning the Seaway Shootout Tournament to uh, that diamond, which will involve bringing roughly 90 teams into the area. And we are also hosting on that field the 15U Baseball Ontario AA Championships in 2022. Next slide, please. The problem with the diamond uh, at the moment is that it is exposed uh, to sun from sunup to sundown. It is constantly swept by uh, wind in that area, which dries things out. And compounding the problem is, is that the base underneath the diamond is basically sand, which means uh, it drains extremely quickly. Great if we have a rainy season, but if we don't get rain on that field for more than about uh, less than four days, uh, it dries out completely, which what that results basically in is, I wouldn't say unsafe playing conditions, but it turns the field into effectively concrete, uh, both on the base paths and on the grass. And in the longer term, it destroys the grass, which uh, requires uh, more work by the Parks and Rec Department to keep it up to up to snuff. Um, so, and as I, as I mentioned in this slide, um, I think it's fair to safe to project that as our summers get hotter and droughts become more prevalent, this problem is gonna continue and, and be exacerbated. Next slide, please. We have been in discussions with Yates Sprinklers about the idea of extending the irrigation system that's currently used for all of the soccer pitches at South Gore Park over to the Big Diamond at South Gore 3. And what you have on this slide is a diagram of their proposal on how to ir properly irrigate the field. Next slide, please. 
One thing that uh, we were concerned about, and I think the municipality was con concerned about, was whether the existing irrigation system had the capacity to handle the extra square footage if we were to irrigate South Core 3. And in talking to Chuck Yates, he assures us that there is capacity to be able to handle uh, the further requirements that would come about as a result of this uh, extension of the irrigation system. The projected cost in 2020 was about $22,500. Uh, Mr. Yates says that given uh, material increases, the cost in 2022 would be about $25,000. And we, again, as part of, as a partner in this project, would like to commit $10,000 to help uh, the municipality defray the cost. So in a nutshell, those are our two uh, requests and certainly open to any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, colleagues? I'm just scanning the screen. Um, Mr. Hamilton, were you able to have a season this past year? Yes, we did. We had a full season, Your Worship. We both competitive and house league. The only thing that we couldn't do uh, is hold our tournament, uh, the Seaway Shootout. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, it was a full season, roughly 600 games played. Wow. And have your enrollment numbers fluctuated at all with the pandemic? We we go up, well, not with the pandemic, no. And even in 2020, we, we had a full season and we're able to put all our competitive okay. teams on the field. So and if, if it only fluctuates in the sense that in 2015, we had about 100 registrants and this year we had 750 registrants. Okay, uh, so significant growth there. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, colleagues, seeing nothing? Um, Mr. Hamilton, I know that some of these projects may be already on the radar of Parks and Rec. Uh, so we'll certainly take this opportunity uh, after the meeting uh, to see where Parks and Rec may have some of these items uh, or have may have already anticipated some of these items, but the presentation was very fulsome and we appreciate it. You're obviously a huge driver of competitive baseball, not just here in North Granville, but in Eastern Ontario. So uh, it's, it's great to see. The only question I had is in Riverside Park, to make the accommodations that you've requested, does it preclude then uh, softball players from using that particular field? I think, no, I don't think it precludes them using it. They haven't ever used the field. It's been strictly uh, a baseball game. Okay. There's a mound there which they don't use. So they intend to instead use one and three. I see. So really this is just to get this additional field up to standard so you can fully use it. Is that correct? Just to bring it up yep. to safety standards so that we, we defray the, the possibility of uh, further injuries to our players. Understood. Okay. That's uh, that's helpful context. Thank you. Yep. I don't see anything from council. So I'll uh, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate the presentation very much. Not at all, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, I'm just gonna go back to my agenda. I have to switch screens, so I apologize. Uh, we've got the Kempfield uh, Golf Club. Uh, and to that end, we have uh, Mr. Dwayne Dowdle. Welcome, Dwayne. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Councillors. Uh, my name is Dwayne Dowdell, and um, I'm here on behalf of the Kempfield Disc Golf Club. I am the founding member, we're a brand new club. Mm. Uh, we just started this spring with the installation of our uh, nine hole disc golf course at the Ferguson Forest Center Arboretum. Um, next slide, please. I'm just gonna go over a few things tonight with you. It's, uh, it's some highlights of uh, a more extensive uh, submission I, I gave uh, in terms of the community grant. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, a little <laughs> quote always, uh, softens everybody up, I hope. So you can't buy happiness, but you can buy a Frisbee and throw it around and that's pretty close. Next slide. So I'll get right to it. Um, the uh, request that we're asking for is uh, $7,500. Um, this money is used to expand the uh, current uh, nine hole layout that we have into an 18 hole layout. And this is gonna require the purchase of nine more disc golf baskets uh, of a commercial grade. Uh, they're uh, much better than the ones we currently have out there and they'll last a lot longer and are meant for public use. Um, so we're seeking to expand it um, and we're doing so uh, to meet the need, uh, to uh, meet the need of the phenomenal growth that disc golf has seen in our community 
uh, people are looking for a greater challenge uh, and more variety. Uh, the number of users is, uh, is just growing day by day out there. If you've ever been out, you'll see people out throwing Frisbees at these strange looking uh, contraptions that I have right behind me there. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a game that's uh, played a lot like golf, uh, but it, except you use Frisbees and you throw them into the chains and into the basket to uh, finish off your hole. Um, so I, I really, I really believe that as part of, uh, you know, North Grenville recognized as Canada's most active community by participation in 2021, you know, the residents have demonstrated their commitment to an active and healthy lifestyle and disc golf is just another, uh, option. And it's a great, enjoyable, uh, recreational activity that supports those values. Um, next slide, please. So the baskets uh, and the signage that we're gonna be requesting uh, uh, to pay for is uh, the, the baskets, as I sp spoke to earlier, are of a higher grade. So they're a little more costly than the ones we have out there, but they'll last a lot longer. Um, the baskets themselves um, are portable and they'll be able to put it, we'll be able to put them in and pull them out at the end of the season. Um, the signage, we have to meet uh, certain criteria that have been laid out by the Ferguson Forestry uh, Corporation in terms of having appropriate signage. Um, we do have some signs out, out there now um, on the course, but they're basically paper that have been uh, laminated and stapled to a, a wood stake. Um, we're looking to get some uh, quality signage that'll last uh, for a long time, and we'll have them on every single hole, uh, as well as directional signs and uh, rules of play. Next slide, please. So the, uh, the Kempfield Disc Golf Club, I mean, who are we? We're a club that uh, was newly formed. Um, we're a nonprofit and we support the game of disc golf in the municipality. And uh, we are comprised of over 60 people, um, mostly from the local community, but quite a few uh, from outside the, uh, the community itself. It's drawing people in. Um, the, uh, the disc golf courses that are available in the region are, are very few. Um, mind you, some are popping up here and there. Uh, Almont has one, uh, Brockville has a new one, and uh, there's a few up in Ottawa, but uh, it's fairly new. Um, so why are we a club? Well, we were um, established out of a need to form a, re a relationship with Ferguson Forestry and uh, to design and install the course uh, on that look at the Arboretum. Um, and what, what do we do? Um, we're responsible for all things uh, disc golf related. Uh, we're members of the Ontario Disc Sports Association and we, we're the caretakers of the course. Um, we don't cut the grass, we're lucky enough we don't have to do that. Uh, the Ferguson Forest Centre looks after that. But uh, we support the, uh, the municipality's uh, master plan in the area of recreation. Um, we like to promote uh, all things disc golf and uh, we serve as a working partner with the Ferguson Forestry Center to, uh, to increase the, uh, the usage of that area in a, in a multi-use uh, multi platform. Uh, next slide, please. So my justification uh, is it, it, it is in direct support of the North Grenville uh, Recreation and Culture uh, Master Plan. And as per the master plan, uh, it supports the vision statement by facilitating community responsive parks, recreation and culture services. So it's a healthy, uh, for healthy physical activity and well-being. Um, an 18 hole round of disc golf uh, on average, it will, will register 10,000 steps. Um, for the typical player. So it, you don't even notice it when you're out there, you're gonna rack up the steps. Um, further to the master plan, um, it's a, an, another enjoyable activity that offers opportunities for a healthy lifestyle, greater cognitive development and self-esteem among individuals. Um, it requires patience, the game. It requ requires problem solving, honesty and acceptance. And these are values that we all, we all uh, can appreciate. Um, members of the community to have. Um, 
as per the master plan, it's another me, disc golf is another means of promoting awareness on the critical importance of outdoor play within parks and open spaces. And what a perfect place for it uh, in Ferguson. Uh, disc golf offers, uh, a, offers peaceful and quiet moments uh, out uh, while, you, while you're connecting with nature. And if you're not frustrated with the odd uh, errant shot that you may take. Um, disc golf is, it's not commonly found in a lot of communities. So this, this is a unique uh, opportunity for Campville to set itself apart from uh, a lot of surrounding areas. It's, uh, you know, having this sport entrenched in the community as a recreation option, it adds to the existing variety of social and physical activities uh, available. It's gonna attract people and it has attracted people. And when people come here, they spend money and they, they check out our town, they check out our, our whole uh, municipality and they, they find that uh, we have a lot to offer, not just disc golf, but we have a lot to offer in many other areas. Um, what else do I have here for the master plan? Just one quick last point on the master plan. Um, there's the master plan, uh, disc golf supports it by, uh, the, like I said, the act of living, the inclusion and access. Disc golf has practically no barriers. It's affordable for everybody. And it's, uh, it's, it supports the environment. There's, it's non-intrusive to the, to the current uh, environment. It's just disc golf exists uh, harmoniously wherever you put it. Um, next slide, please. And I just covered most of that, I think. So we'll, we'll go yeah. to the next slide. Now the community impact of disc golf. Um, disc golf, um, you know, the physical health is obvious. You're out there in, uh, walking around um, and, and being active. Uh, and, and with that comes uh, a positive effect on mental health. Um, it's, it's something that uh, I've, you know, anecdotal, anecdotally, I've, I've had people come up to me and, and express how important this, this new game has been to them, uh, especially coming out of, or we're still in COVID times, but we're slowly emerging from it. And this has been a, a savior for many people. And I've had one, one gentleman has approached me uh, on more than one occasion and explained how it's uh, positively affected his uh, PTSD symptoms. He's uh, normally laid up five days a week, um, but he's out playing disc golf more and more and his, his, uh, his PTSD is diminished. And, and that's a testament to how physical activity equals uh, good mental health. Um, some quick statistics um, before I finish up here. The, uh, the Kempfield, uh, our, our disc golf course in Kempfield has been, has received um, excellent reception by, by uh, new disc golfers and experienced disc golfers alike. It's uh, uh, on our uh, Facebook page, we have 229 followers. We've got 90 local residents uh, that are spread out and the rest are spread out over Eastern Ontario. We have positive uh, ratings on Google, uh, 4.8 out of five. Um, there's a special app for disc golf called UDisc and it's rated us in the top three in Eastern Ontario already in our, in our first season. Um, the UDISC app, app has reported uh, 1,267 rounds played. That's 1,267. And that is only for the people who even use the app. So uh, I, I, I estimate that number to be much higher. Um, next slide, please. We've, uh, just before I get to the slide, um, we've formed partnerships as well in the community. And I, and I think that's an important part of uh, of, of this game. Um, we've forged par partnerships with the, uh, the library where you can sign out um, three discs at no charge to come out and try the course and try the game for yourself. You get a little map and some instructions, a little bag, and you got your three Frisbees and you head out and play and it's free to play. Um, we've also uh, formed a partnership with the Kempville Youth Center where we've uh, donated discs to them as well. And uh, the youth center liked it so much they even incorporated it into their uh, uh, their summer program where they play once a week. Um, 
let's go to the next. Oh, sorry. Well, I'll just finish up on this one here. So as I stated, the, the expenditure will be for the, uh, for the nine more baskets. Um, those are run around $6,000 for nine more and the signs uh, about 1500. So we're looking at a total of 7,500. Uh, next slide, slide, please. And we'll just ask that you um, wrap it up. Uh, I know you're close to the end in this. I love disc golfing. I've had the experience. So yeah, I'm sorry. Because we have eight other presenters, but this has been excellent. So if you could just. Um, yeah, I'll wrap it right up. Perfect. Um, as far as the future goes. Um, awesome. This is just a one time injection. We're self sustaining through donations, uh, sponsorship, uh, membership fees, et cetera. And it's an ongoing uh, assessment. We'll, we'll assess ourselves as we need to in the future. And I know I want to ask, answer this one question, this one concern is if we only get half the money or if we don't get any at all, um, it will, it will delay our, our expansion, but we'll be able to pull through with other sources. Thank you. Next slide. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was a very thorough presentation. I think it's not lost on uh, any council member or many members of the community that uh, Ferguson Forest saw a number of new amenities at Disc Golf among them. And it truly is a, a highly inclusive, fun, and non-pressure. I, I think some people are take it very seriously <laughs> for those non-competitive um, players. It really is a pleasure to spend some time in Ferguson Forest in that way. I've got two questions from Deputy Mayor and Council Barkley, so go ahead. Uh, th thank you, Duane, for this. Uh, just a couple of quick items. Um, first off, the nets that you have there now, are you currently keeping those and adding to, to them? or are you getting rid of them, selling them or whatever? Second question, uh, with the FSC, have they already agreed to, I'm assuming you're using more uh, more acreage or more area for this and have you mapped out uh, where the nets are going to be and how much area you're taking up? Is there, have you produced a map or a plan of what that looks like? Yes, I have. Uh, the baskets that we currently have out there, um, they are, they'll be pulled out the end of uh, this month and they the as far as the expansion goes we are we already have been approved by the Ferguson Forester Forestry uh, Center uh, to uh, use some land that is directly north uh, I've walked it with them uh, it's been passed uh, through them and uh, I have a map and a layout as well. So the nine baskets that I'm asking for are in addition to the existing nine that we have already to turn it into a full 18 hole uh, disc golf course. Good, thank you. Uh, Council Parkley? Yes, uh, thanks, Dwayne. Um, I've got two questions as well. <clears throat> Certainly. Uh, but beforehand, uh, I, I can't wait to have my first game. I think I got hooked by uh, some online postings by a certain T-Rex, I think uh, people might yes. know. I okay. know T-Rex very well. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that first game of mine. Um, regarding the Ferguson Forest Center Corporation, you, you've got, a, as you call it, a relationship with them. Is it a memorandum of understanding? Is it a lease agreement? What, what is it? Yes, uh, the relationship that we have with them is a land use agreement that uh, we just renewed for another three years going forward. So uh, they're happy, we're very happy, and uh, we look forward to working with them uh, in the years to come. And uh, are you operating under their insurance uh, arrangement or the municipalities since it's municipal property? How are you handling insurance? No, we have our, our own liability insurance uh, and we obtained that through the Ontario Disc Sports Association and it, it met, uh, it was suitable uh, level of coverage and it satisfied the uh, FCC. Great, thank you. And of course, uh, Duane, I noted that while you have 60 members per se, uh, obviously anybody can show up and use the disc golf course without being a member of the club is my understanding, is that correct? Yep, that's 100% true. Um, anybody can come at any time, membership mm -hmm. is not required to play and it's always free. Excellent. Uh, well, I, I can say that I've taken uh, 
several children and they've had a ball. So it's a, it's a really neat uh, way to spend some time in Ferguson. So I appreciate very much your presentation and, and your investment of time and energy and another uh, new recreational opportunity in the, not just the community of North Granville, but for surrounding areas as well. I think these destination experiences are, are really important. Uh, they keep people in North Granville and they attract others here. So um, it, you're bang on in terms of the economic and community development um, investments. And uh, thank you also for, for mentioning participation because we are very proud of having uh, secured that title. Thank you so much for your efforts and your time tonight. You're most welcome. Have a good evening. All right. Yeah, take care. All right, uh, next we have Kimple Pride and we'll welcome, I think, uh, Devin Warren, Jen Crawford and Melissa Button. All right, Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Councillors, and other guests. Uh, Jem Crawford is not with us tonight to present. It's just myself. I'm Devin Warren, and I'm with my friend and partner in crime, Melissa Button, uh, to do our little presentation for you this evening. Um, so just a quick overview. Kempo Pride's been established since 2019. Um, and it's basically been created to uh, create a support network for North Grenville's LGBTQ2S plus community and its allies. So next slide, please. So the reason that we're here tonight and what we're requesting is um, Kempel Pride is looking to obtain some funding. We are a not-for-profit organization, so solely function on uh, generous donations from local businesses and supporters. And we are looking to um, get some grant funding in order to develop a uh, diversity and inclusion-based training for the North Grenville area. Um, so right now we have a working group that has been started, uh, local residents and volunteers who have started to put together some great ideas and some content around this training. Um, and um, basically what the training would be like is almost like an LGBTQ2S plus 101. Um, we'll get into the details of kind of what we're thinking for this session in a minute, uh, training session in a minute. Sorry, it's been a really long day, so I'm a little tongue tied. Um, and so this training would basically be offered to anybody within the Kempville area. We'd be targeting local businesses, school, law enforcement agencies, members of the public, um, anybody and everybody who we could possibly sit down and talk with and uh, educate them on the LGBTQ2S plus community. And um, similar to for those that are old enough to remember, kind of like the block parent um, good old days, uh, anybody that has completed the training with us would receive a decal that they could display in their home or in their place of business to identify themselves as a safe place for the LGBTQ2S plus community. Um, so that if anybody is ever in need of help or assistance, they know that they have a safe place to go to in order to um, receive help and have somebody understand them. So next slide, please. So essentially the training, uh, what will it consist of? So we will be going over um, the LGBTQ2S plus definitions and terminology uh, because quite a few people uh, actually still do not know a lot of the definitions and terminology. Uh, the importance of proper pronoun usage. Um, so she, her, he, him, they, them. Uh, just because when there has been a trouble, troublesome um, thing happen, uh, addressing the person in the proper pronouns is, is really important, extremely important. Uh, debunking the myths and stereotypes within the LGBTQ2S plus community. Um, we also want to really focus this area uh, on the transgender piece um, mm -hmm. because there's so much stereotypes and myths that go along with that. Um, the history of LGBTQ, LGBTQS2+, <laughs> uh, in Canada, um, the effects of trauma within the community and how to properly address situations in which someone may be triggered, um, and then also just how to be a proper ally and, and friend in our community, you know, uh, when somebody has the courage to uh, come out to you, how, how's the proper response? Um, or if somebody's in trouble, what is the proper way to respond? And this is really just the beginning. Um, this is sort of like the, the base model for the seminar. Um, the hope is once we get going, meet with the community, 
start educating the community. Um, we'll be able to grow uh, our content uh, and more tailor it based on very specific things that the community is asking for, but we feel that this is a really good starting point. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the, um, who would be focusing on providing training to? Um, the joke between Melissa and I when we talk about this is basically anybody with a heartbeat and who's breathing, you're our target audience. So community organizations, local businesses, schools, local police detachments, parents, um, basically anybody that's looking to receive the training. Um, I actually just got told a very sad story today that we had um, one of the LGBTQ2S plus youth at one of the schools in, in Kepville that um, received some harassment and bullying behavior at school. And because the um, adult individual the adult <laughs> didn't know how to respond to this, um, the solution was victim blaming instead of addressing the situation. So it just brings to light that um, this is everywhere. We need to address it um, basically in all the groups that we've mentioned here and anybody that's willing to sit down and listen. So Sorry. next slide, please. Um, so a question that comes up a lot is, you know, how do we know what the community needs? Well, um, this year we did hire an executive director and number one was completing an environmental scan in our, in our area and figuring out what gaps were identified um, within our community. And uh, right off the bat, lack of education and awareness uh, was huge in our community. Um, diversity and inclusion uh, related training is a key mandate for several organizations and businesses in the Kempville area. Um, but without proper funding, it's really, it, I don't think we would be able to do it without it. Um, and, you know, the gaps in our, oh, where is it here? Um, yeah, I mean, we wouldn't be able to do it. We, we need a safe space for our LGBTQ2 plus, plus community to go. Um, I even had it today in my office. Um, a youth actually opened up to me today. Uh, in the privacy of my office and came out to me because they saw that I was a safe place. Um, and that child doesn't have a safe place. It's, and it was very sad and it was very hard. And um, I was very privileged to be part of that. But once again, it just kind of drove home that we need a space where these youth know they can go and be loved, be accepted and get the resources they need. Um, you shouldn't have you know, to go to a local bank <laughs> to get that. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll just fly through this one. So we've already had a lot of interest from key partners in the org um, in the community, different organizations that are willing to um, go through a pilot with us, test the training before we launch it wide um, to make sure that we've got the content and stuff down pat. We want to make sure that we get this right. Our group yeah. of volunteers that's um, putting together this training, we are making sure that we've got somebody um, who's got lived experience as a transgendered person um, representing that piece. Um, so we can uh, move on from that slide since we know we are on the clock. Sorry, I took over. <laughs> um, so like Melissa was saying, like we're, we're seeing these almost on a daily basis, these incidents that um, are are alienating our, our youth and some of our, the other adults um, or community members, I should say. Um, we've seen an increase in violent, uh, violence and harassment towards the LGBTQ2S plus youth, especially in the kind of old town Kempville area. Um, so we're kind of asking for two things. We've got the training development and with that goes the um, like the promotional material and all that stuff that we would need to actually deliver and, and do the training. And we've also got a request that would be um, a space where we can actually have a community presence um, where people can come to us to get information, to talk to somebody. We can offer the training sessions within that space. We can create a space for the youth to come if they're running into issues. Um, so it, it's kind of an all encompassing request, um, trying to stretch the money as best as we can. We're even looking at possibility of sharing space, uh, roving space if we needed to go to different locations. Obviously, there's a need in the schools right now. Um, so, you know, uh, a bunch of different opportunities for us to do 
things, but the time is now. The community is open. Uh, we're seeing the need on a daily basis, so that's why we are here requesting the funding. Yeah, and we did, uh, we recently did, uh, we put out a survey actually, and uh, it was amazing the, the responses mm -hmm. and how much the community is actually asking for that safe space. Um, and like Devin said, you know, right outside my work, a youth was attacked and um, didn't feel safe to go into any of the local businesses, instead ran and went back to the park to find other people. Whereas um, in this area, every business I've spoken to says, oh my gosh, had I known, we would have wrapped our arms around that youth. And in that situation, that is why the use of pronouns would be important, right? And making sure that youth feels accepted um, as they are. So we can actually skip to Great. next one. <laughs> yeah, thank you. This is so interesting, um, but we probably should near wrap up and we'll, of course, we'll have the slide presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So you yeah. can uh, go to the next one. We can actually, um, I mean, we can just open it up to questions now. The deck is fairly straightforward and, and mm -hmm. uh, explanatory. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions, we'll definitely be cognizant of the time and we'll answer your questions and then allow the next people to, to speak. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we have such thoughtful community groups. It's such a blessing. <laughs> it's such a blessing. Uh, so I see Deputy Mayor. So I'll acknowledge Deputy Mayor for a question. Hey, thank you, uh, Evan and Melissa. Melissa, a question for you. Um, can you explain to me uh, what the 15,000 15, will use for? I mean, I get it for training. Are you doing it from scratch here? Are you buying courses? Because I noticed uh, online there's a ton of material available, Canadian as well, uh, already done up. I'm just wondering where you're going with this. Is this more uh, money to actually get the training out there or is it actually to develop from scratch? Are you doing it from scratch? That's my main question, thanks. Yeah, so sure. if you don't mind, Deputy Mayor, I'll answer that since I'm the, uh, the money lady. <laughs> so the, um, the funding that we're requesting is we are developing this training from scratch. We are looking at various resources that um, we have access to. Obviously, there's some amazing organizations in Ottawa that we are looking to for things like the definitions, proper use of pronouns, things that have already been created that we can... Um, use as inspiration and then put a, a rural spin on it. There's no um, rural training like this anywhere that we are aware of. Um, so this is, uh, this is a big deal and that's why we wanna make sure that we're gonna get it right. We're gonna take the time to do it, but we are doing it from scratch. We are doing it with a group of volunteers. So that money is essentially for the design and the build of the training. Um, maybe we can hire somebody to put together uh, the presentation for us. We would need promotional material. Um, that money could go towards rent and set up costs if we can get a space that we can offer the training from, uh, pamphlets, all of that type of thing. So um, we've got the same cost in the first two years as that's going to be kind of our growth year, our design and development. And then ongoing, it would be um, more of a maintenance type of thing. Uh, as we get established. I hope that answers your question. And so you expect volunteer-led training. So you will be training the volunteers who give the actual education sessions? So right now, as it stands, um, you're looking at your trainers. <laughs> we've, uh, we've volunteered to take this on, but we would also like to develop a train-the-trainer type of module uh, so that we can have in, in a perfect world, in my dream world, I would love to have ambassadors in all of the different businesses who have taken this training and that we can mm -hmm. train to be those LGBTQ2S plus ambassadors, um, mm -hmm. make sure that the business stay um, inclusive. And if there's any questions, we have those go-to people. Um, and then, yeah, it, obviously the two of us can't handle it for mm -hmm. forever. So yeah. we'll have to train more minions to help us out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, and part of that money is our vision is having a space, right? Mm -hmm. That we can is somebody can come to and know that they're safe in that space that mm -hmm. has all the resources laid out. We have all the brochures ready to go. Yeah. Um, mental health, um, mm -hmm. anything, you know, a parent, mm -hmm. they, you know, everything at our disposal. And unfortunately that does take quite a bit of cost, right? Just to get it all up and ready printed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'll recognize Councilor Strachan. And I'll put myself back on the list at the end. Go ahead, Councillor. 
thank you. Um, hello, Melissa. Hi, Devin. Um, obviously, you know that I'm a huge supporter of this. Um, I'm happy to be part of the, the working group and the volunteers that are um, partaking in building this training. And I think it's uh, definitely a worthwhile effort. And I think that there's, there's definitely a need for it, um, as you've indicated. Um, I guess one of the, the main questions I have is when you look at what kind of space you would like to have, um, there's, there's part of it is, you know, looking at four years for funding and so on to be able to establish that, but you know, there's, there needs to be a long-term um, sustainability piece for that. So I guess is, um, you know, have you, have you thought about how this could be sustained beyond requiring a yearly grant of, um, you know, a fairly sizable grant each year? And um, have you, given consideration to what shared spaces may work for you um, so that you could alleviate some of this cost, perhaps share some of that with uh, another community-minded organization and so on. So thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for your question. Um, we are looking at longer term solutions. Uh, part of our executive director's responsibility when we took uh, Jennifer on board is to do a three-year strategic plan. And this is definitely something that's at the front of that strategic plan is figuring out a long-term solution for um, space so that we can actually put into action all of the, the wish lists that we've come up with through the environmental scan and hearing what the community has to say. Um, I've already been starting to talk to people, um, different businesses, uh, community organizations. We're always kind of have our ears open to see if there's anything, any opportunities. Um, I've been talking to folks at the Campbell College campus to see if there's any space there. Um, we're very open to everything. We haven't put a whole lot of time and effort into it right now, just because we are only a very small group of volunteers. Um, but it definitely is on the radar um, and we, we will invest time and energy into doing that. We're just, um, I guess it's deciding whether to put the energy into doing it now or wait to find it if we've got a source of funding and then start to look for, um, for a space that fits accordingly. As a not-for-profit, it's really, it's really tricky. We brought Jennifer on board as our executive director because we got a federal grant Mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, we're so thankful that we got, but yeah, having to rely on grants, that takes another volunteer writing <laughs> grant submissions almost as a full-time uh, position. So it's, it's a lot of work for sure. We'd love to win the lottery, but we can't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, Madam Mayor, if you don't mind, I just have yep. one more question regarding sure. the engagement, because I know that the, the schools are all doing, um, I think, uh, um, a good job at trying to um, move the yardstick forward as far mm -hmm. as inclusion and uh, you know, recognizing diversity and making sure that the conversation evolves. Um, obviously, there's still work to be done. Um, but uh, given that there are um, four school boards here, two of them in French, um, is there a plan to make that uh, training available in a bilingual format uh, so that the uh, French school boards can also avail themselves of that, uh, that training in a, in a meaningful way in the language of their choice? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Thank you. We want to be inclusive for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we can add translation costs into the, uh, into the budget request. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And we, we do have to move on, but Devin, just a final question. I understand that you actually have some expertise in the area when it comes to some of the training that you're speaking of, given your own role professionally. Um, and that uh, that certainly the, the grant that you spoke of from the federal government was not insignificant in terms of getting the organization up and running. And I know council colleagues probably have that question about sustainability, right, in the long run. So I think it's worth mentioning that uh, you've made some early investments in uh, both, I think, developing capacity of the organization, but also if you could just speak like 30 seconds to your own professional background that I assume is also informing some of the training you hope to develop. Yeah, so for those that don't know, my, my other, 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 other job is I work for the RCMP as a public servant and I work for a team called the Vulnerable Persons Unit. And one of the portfolios we hold is the LGBTQ2S plus uh, portfolio. So I actually have access to a lot of internal training. Uh, we just launched a trauma-informed training. We launched a cultural awareness and humility training. So I have access to all of those tools, obviously not um, going to copy, write, and, and plagiarize, I should say, any of that. But I have a wealth of um, access to uh, information and resources for sure. Okay, awesome. This has been great. Thank you very much. I, I don't see any other questions and we should move on, but like another very substantial uh, presentation this evening. Thank you so much for taking the time and for being such dedicated volunteers.
Super appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, uh, next is Aaron uh, from the, uh, Aaron Wong rather. Uh, and we welcome Aaron um, from the Kempville Salvation Army Food Bank. Welcome Ms. Wong. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Peckford, Deputy Mayor McManaman, Council and other guests. My name is Erin Wong. I'm the Director of Community and Family Services at the Salvation Army in Kempville. If the pandemic is a storm, the Kempville Salvation Army has been a lighthouse and a port with our community food bank. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We may all be in this together, but we are not all in the same boat. Some are in speed boats with a full tank of gas. Some are in yachts. Others are clinging to hope in a lifeboat, waiting for it all to be over. Next slide, please. Every individual and family has experienced this pandemic personally. And for a variety of reasons, many members of our own community have been forced to access the food bank for the very first time. Next slide, please. Like most communities across the country, we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of individuals and families accessing our services. Some see it as a temporary measure to supplement their benefits while they are laid off. Others depend on the food bank to fill the gap while they use their limited income to cover other expenses such as utilities, gas, and housing. This past quarter, we have assisted 19 households who have housing insecurity, precarious housing, or who are homeless. Next slide, please. Before the pandemic struck, we had an average of 40 regular families visiting the food bank. Our number is now closer to 130. Each family is able to access the food bank twice per month, leaving with a box containing approximately $60 worth of food every two weeks. Next slide, please. While our demand has increased, our ability to stock our shelves with our usual fundraising initiatives has been hampered by the pandemic. For example, we were unable to run the fill a bag campaign that you see in the picture there. It would require too much manpower during a time when COVID protocols prohibited large gatherings and specific food storage, um, specific food storage requirements was cumbersome. Next slide, please. We have been the grateful recipients of some government funding, $147,000 in social services relief funding and $49,000 in funding from AgriCan Canada. These funds helped us meet the need as we have procured large amounts of food. We were also able to purchase industrial fridges and freezers. This allowed us to continue to offer our food bank clients basic healthy food like milk, eggs, and meat products, as well as cheese, while also managing the larger demand. Next slide, please. This, the Kempville Salvation Army Food Bank has continually benefited from the generosity of our local community, something we can all be very proud of. Individuals, groups, and businesses have stepped up time and time again to operate their own fundraising campaigns and programs and initiatives on our behalf. When they are able, local grocery stores stock our freezers and shelves. Farmers bring in fresh produce. People take part in annual events, raising money through the Santa Shuffle, and collecting toys that will be distributed to our food bank client families through Toy Mountain and the Angel Tree program. Next slide, please. We are working hard to maintain and build on our current sources of funding through a number of activities. We will continue to research and apply for government funding. We will work to support our community fundraisers while coming up with new programs and initiatives to support our needs and keep our food bank shelves fully stocked. As we look to the future, however, it seems that we are growing to the point where we will have to do what food banks in larger cities have done, and that is to develop partnerships with local businesses um, through a sponsorship program. It is in the beginning stages at this point, but local businesses will soon receive an email and follow-up phone call requesting financial support. This sponsorship program will be an excellent opportunity for our sponsors to build brand awareness as they help us feed the community. Next slide, please. The Kempville Salvation Army has operated the local food bank for decades through the support of the generosity of a loyal band and generosity of a loyal band of hardworking volunteers. We could not do what we do without the ongoing generosity and support of our community. When you support the Kempville Salvation Army, you are lifting up your own neighbor in North Grenville. Next slide, please. 
The Salvation Army is a vital member of the North Renville Emergency Services Network. We are among the first to lend a helping hand when a local family or individual is in need. Our food bank is just one of the ways that we help, but due to our sudden increase in clientele, it is the area we need to secure funding for in order to have a successful future. We do not anticipate the need for food support to decrease anytime soon. People are returning to work where possible, but for many, this pandemic has changed things indefinitely. We do not want to see the day when we have to um, turn a family away. You pray that never happens. We have been a port in the storm during this pandemic. We are asking Municipal Council to support us with a 2022 community grant to supplement our ongoing efforts. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time and consideration of our request. Our thanks also to Diana Fisher, who helped us with this prep um, in preparation for this presentation. We realize that you have a number of worthy applications to consider, and we appreciate the opportunity to at least make the community aware of our current situation and forecasted need for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, any questions from council colleagues? in terms of the service. So um, Aaron, obviously the food bank is open to any member of North Granville, no questions asked. You can come once or every two weeks. Um, and I understand you have some capacity to choose the kinds of foods or supplies you need, including pet food, hygiene products, cleaning supplies, et cetera, is that right? That's right, yeah. We went to a client choice pantry many years ago um, with COVID, we had to pivot like many organizations did, and we created a new food order form. So, so people will come and they'll choose items off the order form, and then we'll prepare the boxes for them in advance. But yes, it includes everything that you mentioned. Okay. And uh, you just spoke of people coming out of the pandemic and some people being able to um, return to work if there was a, a, a disruption, if you will. But you also spoke of people... With, with perhaps longer term cha challenges financially or employment wise. Can you just in two minutes or less, um, just describe that for us so that we better understand mm -hmm. where those challenges lie for individuals or families who are struggling? Is, is it pandemic related or is it mental health related? Where do you see uh, some of the biggest factors? Well, I think there's many factors that contribute to that. Um, the housing situation, the housing uh, crisis that we're in is a big contributing factor. Um, also, mental health is, is huge. But I know one of the volunteers, one of our newest volunteers, recently made a comment about how surprised they were to see um, all different kinds of people accessing the food bank. Um, so we definitely have people who have been um, out of work uh, through the pandemic who've never needed to access the food bank before and um, really have just not been able to get back on their feet. Um, we have people who have been on assistance for a long time and have all kinds of challenges in terms of, of employability and things like that. And so of course, we're there to support anyone and everyone. Um, that, that's the reality is that anyone can find themselves in a situation of being in need unexpectedly. There's, there's various emergencies and crises in life. And for many of our clients, they, the food budget is the only elastic part of their budget. Mm -hmm. So if they have a car repair or they have um, a furnace breakdown or someone who's ill and requiring medication, these things, they, they, they don't have any room to recover from those things. And so those things set them back. Some people are, are accessing our services for a very short period of time while they get through a crisis like that. Other people depend on our services and quite frankly, could not do it without it. Mm -hmm. And when you speak of the housing issue, is it because the fixed costs for housing are so high that it limits people's capacity to spend on groceries? Is that what you, you uh, of course, I am very familiar with some of the housing challenges in North Granville mm -hmm. and beyond, but when you invoke housing, is it because of the cost of housing? 
Well, there, there's still, there's many issues even involved with that because um, we have a limited number of, of social housing units available in our area. And so people will be on wait lists for a long period of time, up to two years. When they have an emergent housing need, it's difficult to wait two years for a, a house. And so we have multiple families dwelling in the same unit um, in order to try and, and make the situation affordable. And so there's all kinds of issues and complications that come with that situation as well. So mm -hmm. then we have a lot of um, people who have uh, rental properties that have been sold as the market mm -hmm. has increased, and that's displaced many people as well. So it's a very um, complex situation, the, the crisis. There's many, many aspects to it, but many people are suffering right now from housing related issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, colleagues, any other questions? No. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Aaron. And uh, I know uh, Kelvin and the team at the Salvation Army are working very hard, especially with the launch of your kettle campaign. So we appreciate um, your presentation this evening and you are absolutely correct. It also brings awareness to the community about uh, the realities that uh, you know some of our families and seniors and residents are facing. And that's critically important to, to really shine the light on that. We appreciate this very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Aaron, for what you guys are doing there. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Okay, uh, colleagues, so we'll keep going. Uh, maybe we'll take a break after presentation number six. So uh, next, we'll invite the North Granville Community Theater, Mr. Steve Went, uh, to make a presentation. Mr. Went, do I have that right? Yes, uh, thank you, Mary, okay. Mayor Peckford, and uh, thank you to the council for the time to talk about. <clears throat> um, this is to talk about Oxford Mills, uh, the old town hall. <clears throat> Next, please. Uh, North Grenville Community Theater is a new name that, uh, that we registered. Uh, our uh, organization is also called Kempville Players Incorporated. We we're incorporated um, some years ago, uh, changed our name to North Granville. Um, I think for similar reasons that the town changed its name to North Granville. Uh, in, and what we're talking about is a storage space for theatrical equipment, primarily costumes that are in the Oxford Mills uh, town hall, the old building. And although I'm speaking on behalf of the North Granville Community theater. I'm also uh, in in touch with the Kempville Youth Musical Theater Company and the North Granville Concert Choir, because both of those organizations are also storing costumes and other equipment at Oxford Mills. Next, please. So, just a reminder of of what these groups do do during non-COVID years. Each of the groups um, does has done its major shows in the in the Municipal Theater at North Granville. And uh, during COVID, we've all uh, had ongoing expenses to, to meet, but basically no income because the, the groups basically uh, survive on ticket sales, uh, membership fees and sponsorships uh, in their, in their uh, <clears throat> ongoing business. Next, please. So one thing that has really helped all of these groups a great deal is uh, access uh, for storage of theatrical equipment, partly at the um, Municipal Theater in the workshop and behind the stage, but uh, also at the Oxford Mills Town Hall. That uh, building has a heritage designation. The water and the heater both turned off, which is to save money. Uh, however, it's um, quite suitable uh, as a location for, for storage of things like costumes. However, we feel that uh, at this point, um, uh, the transfer of some additional money to the uh, facilities uh, uh, management for Oxford Mills Town Hall would help quite a bit. So we're, we're looking at things like uh, work on the doors and locks, uh, the upstairs ceilings, uh, the electrical system to some degree, because even with the heat turned off, the, the primary heat there is electric baseboard. Um, but we still need uh, lighting to be able to get in uh, to access 
things. Next, please. So there's just a few pictures to show what we're talking about in terms of uh, ceilings needing repair, um, the electrical system. And the other topic here is that um, although these three performing arts groups are using the majority of space in the building, there are other users that um, to some degree, I think have just abandoned material there. There are things, uh, we know there's some music from a group that used to uh, perform years ago at, at the town hall when it was a town hall. And, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, um, to work with, uh, with town staff to, to um, regularize, I guess, the use of this space. So after we developed our uh, proposal, I did get a chance to talk to uh, Mark um, from Parks and Recreation and Joe from uh, uh, Facilities Supervision. Uh, I spoke to them on Monday and I think that uh, we really saw eye to eye on, uh, to a great degree on things that could be done. And so um, I recommend that even though we're asking for $5,000, uh, that, that estimate could be uh, refined with, uh, with what Joe thinks is necessary there. Um, also, when we're talking to, uh, when we were talking to Mark and Joe, we know that the long-term plans for this building are very important and uh, we'd like to stay in conversation about that so that's my presentation if there are any questions uh thank you and so just to clarify it has been used as storage um up to now and have have there been any uh, damages due to the the heat not being on at any point or you know sort of a lack of maintenance, if you will, in the building? No, there, there are no damages. Um, <clears throat> speaking for the community mm -hmm. theater that I'm representing, uh, we have insurance on the, the costumes okay. we store there, but, but we have had no damage. Okay. We, we really hugely appreciate the ability to, mm -hmm. uh, to store our things there, really. Okay. So really, it's just in, it's some... Min we'll call them minimal, uh, you know, some basic uh, maintenance issues which facilitate access to the building and allow for um, a little safer storage, if you will. Yeah, and, and like especially this time of year after it gets dark. Now, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think some people may know how to use the lights, but our volunteers have had difficulty with the lights. Mm -hmm. And okay. so one of the things that could be done is uh, put in modern lighting. Uh, some of the some of the lighting doesn't function well when it's cold mm -hmm. because of the types of bulbs that are used. And, you know, a more modern LED type lighting would be an improvement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, so just quickly before I go to others, I see Councillor Barkley. Again, some of the community grants that are coming to us arguably uh, could be accommodated within the regular operational budget of um, the municipality. So whether or not it's a direct grant or a understanding between council and staff uh, that they will invest these resources in the context of their existing operational or 2022 operating budget, I think is the question, operating or capital. Um, it could be either, of course. I will recognize Council Barkley. Yeah, uh, thank you, Steve, for that, uh, for this application, actually, it's very timely mm -hmm. because um, you, you probably aren't aware that the Heritage Advisory mm -hmm. Committee uh, struck a subcommittee to look at the rehabilitation of the old township hall. And they've only recently delivered a report that uh, I forwarded to council and there's there's a, uh, a motion coming forward to council very shortly regarding uh, or requesting staff to look into the viability of rehabilitating the township hall with an eye towards creating a, uh, amongst, uh, for example, an arts hub there, uh, but certainly not limited to, to that idea and to give us an idea of relevant costs. Um, through the work on this subcommittee, uh, we've looked at all the documents produced related to the hall and its use and its deficiencies. So we're very well aware of, of uh, the deficiencies of the building and, uh, and we look forward in the near future to uh, uh, creating the possibility of, of doing much more than what you've Described, I think uh, your your application is a bare minimum. But uh, again, 
uh, you know you uh, you probably can guess that you're going to get a receptive uh, a good reception from me as far as the application, but I'm only one of four votes and we still have to deliberate on it. So but yeah, thank I you very much. I wasn't aware of discussion about that building, but um, there are several locations around Kempville that have potential, I think, in for uh, and are a lot of interest to performing arts groups. That's one of the places the uh, uh, the municipal theater, of course, is a very uh, always of great interest to us and things could be done there. And um, uh, the old the old high school and also uh, the KCAT facility. So at some point, if if we see something developing um, in a more um, uh, in a, in a larger scale, uh, we wouldn't necessarily be asking for money. Uh, mm -hmm. We we could try to contribute uh, funds to something that's yep. going in a useful direction. It is very exciting, Mr. Went. Thank you. And I, I um, sit on the Heritage Committee uh, with Council Brock as well. So the opportunities uh, to create new new potential, uh, certainly for that uh, building, are, are, are very much on our minds, uh, especially in recent months. And Council Barkley has done some good work with um, colleagues on the committee to really uh, advance some thinking. And we look forward to, uh, I think, you know, future discussions on on the fate and the possibilities for those building for the building overall. But what you're asking for is. Um, this evening sounds fairly practical and minimal and, and uh, you know, would respond to some short term needs. I don't see any other hands. So if there aren't any, uh, then uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. But thank you. Uh, thank you for coming this evening, Mr. Wynn. Okay, so we'll hear from one more uh, presenter and uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming Ashley Sloan and Nell Coloma Moya. Uh, both are here to talk about the Poetry Guild. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Councillors and guests. Like Mayor Peckford mentioned, my name is Ashley Sloan. I am the founder of the North Rumble Poetry Guild and presenting with me tonight is Nell Coloma Moya, a co-founder. And slide, please. Another slide. One more slide, please. Our proposal is we are excited to put North Rumble on the map and broadly advertise from Montreal to Toronto and everywhere in between to attend the Experience Art Fest next summer here in North Grenville. And to this end, we seek partnership with the municipality to help pull the event together. Can you go back one slide? One more. Thank you. So in order to do that, we have built a website called Experience Art Fest in um, experienceartfest.com and we invite you to have a look at it. Um, in it, we've got some very um, important uh, events that started from October and will continue on until the um, festival event in June. Our purpose in this website is to build up our audience on a monthly basis, um, both online and in-person events in the spring. So what, uh, next slide, please. Another slide. Here you go. What we will do to promote North Grenville is we would like to splash North Grenville all over our website. And we are currently developing a poetry guild and we're currently having our second workshop this evening at the KYC. Okay. We have monthly events live and online, like Nell mentioned from October to June. And we are featuring local poets, musicians, and artists in our programming. Tonight, we have Anne Walsh doing her journaling workshop tonight. Next slide, please. Next, Next slide. So, so what we want to do is to promote tourism. In the, um, and tourism can be promoted because we have a very important idea of place in um, our website, but also in the workshops that we are conducting um, later on in the spring. Next slide, please. Next slide. There you go. 
So um, what um, our request is for a grant of $10,000, $10,900 um, and a discount for, uh, for the use of the Urbandale Art Center. Um, we would hope to have um, some support from police, fire, and emergency service. But one of our more important requests is to have the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement because we would like to have it as part of our opening ceremonies during the festival. Next slide, please. The date that we picked for our festival is June 25th, and we would love to host it at the Municipal Center, also known as the Urbandale Arts Center. Our theme for the festival is gonna be fusion in the arts through literature, music, visual arts, dance, and food. We have invited several local artists from North Grenville, Ottawa, and Kingston to participate in our programming. We have local groups as well invited to take part. And we've developed a framework to make this event annually. Next slide, please. So there will be tents outside um, um, that, that will be available for arts groups. Um, there, it will be an opportunity for them to increase the visibility of the arts in North Grenville. They'll have the opportunity to recruit and sell their books in their tents. And as an example of this, we are going to have a poetry tent hosted by Bruce Kaufman, who is a poet from Kingston, and he will be featuring um, poets from Toronto, Kingston, and Ottawa, along with an open mic section for local poets to share their work. Next slide, please. One of our fun musical features will be Gary Raspberry, and he will be performing with the students from Oxford on Rideau Public School. They're gonna be doing an, a workshop in the spring and then performing at the festival in Kempo. We also have Pat Johnson invited and he will be doing his circuit workshop and he does a mashup of music and poetry together. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of dance, we have Move Ottawa coming to perform a dance style called House, which again fits into our fusion theme um, it's a fusion between hip hop, jazz, capoeira, tap, salsa, and more. They will have a, a bit of a demo for us if we want to learn some of their moves. But we have reached out to local dance schools to perform on stage as well. Next slide, slide please. We will begin. We will begin our festival with a land acknowledgement from Albert Dumas. And we're going to be ending our evening with an opening from John Wilberforce. He will be opening for our headliner, Erica Lemoy, and her band. Um, and she's also a Franco-Ontarian musician. So the two of them will have a great sound for the evening. And then our festival wraps up at 9 p.m. Next slide, please. Um, one more slide. One more slide. So. In terms of costing, um, I've kind of broken it down here for you. The expenses um, primarily will be coming from um, paying the artists, uh, making sure that they're all uh, compensated for their performances. Um, there is a cost to the venue, which we are asking for some kind of discount for, and there will be um, cost to the merchandise that we hope to bring. The total of that will be $10,900. On the other side will be the revenue that we hope to pull in. Um, ticket prices will be very reasonable at $20 per person. We are estimating or hoping for 300 um, um, participants in the audience. And there will be cost for the use of tents. We'll be approach approaching publishers and the groups. Um, so that will be a source of income for us. And then there will be some revenue as well from merchandise. The total of that would be $9,100. So um, there's just a little bit of a deficit in terms of our totals. Next slide, please. So how are we going to make this festival successful? Our marketing strategy will be to keep our website, experienceartfest.com, current and updated. We would like to advertise on the municipal website and the marquee. We have shared our workshops and our updates on social media with Facebook and Instagram. Once we are given the green light, we can certainly advertise and share among all the groups in North Grenville. 
We have already submitted flyers to the library and local businesses around Kempo to advertise. We would be using the North Grumble Times for some articles um, to feature any of our artists. Bruce Kaufman is willing to allow us to distribute on his email list to get contacts and invite them. And also each art organization, the Writer's Circle, the Art Guild, um, the dance schools, they would be bringing their own community of artists and followers to reach our 300 attendee pool. Next slide, please. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And is the Poetry Guild currently active in terms of some of those activities that you were mentioning either in the lead up or after the fact? Yes, so right now we have a workshop going on upstairs with Ann Walsh. Uh, okay. Uh, did uh, a workshop last month. It was photo poetry that okay. was posted by Mel. And we also have our third workshop coming up next month. And then we have things starting in the spring, doing it online as the weather could be bad. So we figured online would be a great platform. Mm -hmm. All of these things. Yeah, so, so in January, we moved to online in terms of a film screening of, um, of an Indigenous film, um, and it will be hosted by Paul Chaput, uh, the, the person who produced and created that film. Um, in February, we're looking at a photo contest, a poetry contest in March that will be run by, um, by Bruce Kaufman. And, um, and then in the spring, in, when the weather is better and people are out and about a bit more, we'll be running a number of workshops all the way up to the June festival. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I see Kelsa Brockley and Kelsa Strachan. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks, Ashley. And is it uh, Mao? Mao? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, with your mask on, I didn't catch it, but <laughs> we won't belabor the point. Um, so you're showing uh, revenue. Uh, uh, at the end of the first year, but a net loss is, or net gain is, it, so I, I, I'm curious why over years one, two, three, and four, you're, you're, you think you'll be requesting more and more funds, aren't, aren't, aren't you trying to build a nest egg so that you can reinvest each year and grow it and make it more sustainable? I'm a little confused about the multi-year ask. Yes, we plan to go bigger. Um, in terms of um, the acts that we will be bringing in. Um, so- Jan Ardenbeg. We're, we're, yes, yeah, so, so we've got local artists right now. And um, so the, the cost has been manageable in that way. But if we wanted to attract a bigger audience, we would really have to bring, um, you know, names with a little bit more um, recognition. And so that would probably that is kind of what we are anticipating in terms of um, why the costs, um, the request would increase. But aside from that, we are also um, planning on after we have a year under our belt of going for after other funding from the Ontario Arts Council, for instance, so that um, you know we we can again refine the festival to a certain extent. What we've created is a framework for a festival that has a lot of flexibility. So we've invited other arts groups because the vision is really that um, we can all and work together, but that um, the arts itself is um, multimodal in terms of it isn't just visual, it's music, it's poetry, it's text, it's film. And so wanted to be able to do that in, in one event. And so what we highlighted for this year was pretty much um, what we know, which is poetry. That's kind of, that's the, that's the genre that I come from. And I've had, um, I, I've run a number of poetry events in Rockville already. So I had my network and my contacts and my friends, both musicians and poets who are willing to come for the first year to kind of like support me. Um, the, but you know, the next year and subsequent years, in order to make it sustainable, we really need to have um, not just a bigger vision, but probably more marketing dollars um, in order to just make sure it lasts for a long time. 
Is that is that sufficient? Uh, yeah, I, you use the term to make the festival sustainable, and and are you anticipating being able to sustain the festival in, in the future without uh, a community grant from the municipality? I guess to my point. Yes, absolutely. Um, what, so aside from the fact that um, within a number of years we would have built up our base, um, both members in terms of we are looking for local membership, but also um, further abroad. Um, what I'm what I really intend to do is also to to bring in from the urban centers like Toronto poets and um, you know um, musicians and have that flow of artistic um, um, content. And so I did put in the um, in the in the form that we, you know we would like to be able to reach out to, uh, not just the local schools, but also to a school like Ontario College of Art and Design, for instance, and have them partner with us in some way, whether it's um, installations, but to provide a learning environment for um, the students who are going through their programs there as well. So um, at the heart of what we're trying to do is it's really about learning and um, yeah, experiential learning is my buzzword. But anyway, yeah. Okay, uh, Council Barkley, uh, we'll move on then. We'll go to Council Strack again. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate the um, range of um, diversity as far as the types of arts that are um, be being presented and represented, as well as the artists and and their their backgrounds and so on. So I think it um, I think it'll be quite uh, an engaging and show. Um, I would I guess uh, from context from my perspective is the parallel that I would draw for the Soraya Festival when we were presented with that option, the Yoga Festival that took place this year. Um, when it was presented last year, and I know that we're going to have another presentation from them, um, there was a question about, you know, where do you start and, you know, um, starting small and then big, growing bigger based on, you know, uh, one year's experience and being able to figure out where you can expand um, so that it becomes sustainable and that the costs year over year are manageable. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, once you have one under your belt, <laughs> you'll know where to where to take it from there. I think there'll be a, a logical progression. So um, I have no doubt about that. Um, from a sustainable perspective, um, one would hope to see that the, the requests year over year don't continue to grow, because um, that sort of is the opposite of sustainable <laughs> um, from my perspective, from a financial perspective. Um, uh, so I, um, my uh, only comment is uh, along those lines is to understand sort of what comes out of next uh, this upcoming the first festival um, and then to be able to draw on um, you know the statistics that you have from that about what your true uh, amounts were and where you could actually make some of those improvements and perhaps not grow maybe as quickly I, I love Jan Arden but maybe Jan Arden isn't you know year two maybe she's year five or 10. Um, and so it would, uh, it'd be good to see that. Um, and then um, uh, just to, to clarify, um, in this slide presentation, you represented uh, 10,900 as your costs. And that was also your ask for this year. And that the 9,100 in revenue would be help, uh, helping to build up that uh, sort of nest egg for future years, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Nods work for me. <laughs> okay, great. I, I don't see other questions, um, but I want to thank you both. This is a very elaborate proposal, lots of different elements, lots of energy and passion. Uh, and, and no doubt there, we have a community with uh, a very enthusiastic, I think, uh, arts uh, interest, right? Uh, from professional artists to amateur artists and everything in between. And it's, uh, it's so great to see that through a pandemic, uh, the North Granville Poetry Guild, I think, was both established or is thriving in new and different ways. So I know how much you both have put into this proposal and how much you care about it and seeing something come to fruition here. So we appreciate all of your energy and, and thoughtfulness uh, to bring it to us this evening. Thank you. Okay, we look forward to some follow-up and good luck with your workshop upstairs. <laughs> awesome, okay. Uh, so colleagues, we're at 8.07. Uh, I know we've been meeting for a while. Uh, requests for a break have come in, including for myself. Uh, so why don't we take uh, until 8.15?
seven or eight minutes uh, to get yourselves resorted for the last uh, four presentations. Thanks everyone. Just uh, mute your cameras and uh, your
Council, if you're back, just turn on your cameras. Um, we'll give it a couple more minutes, um, but I'm just looking to see who's in the room. Okay. Heather, I believe we have most of the relevant parties. Uh, less. I don't see Councillor Barkley as having. Oh, right. Okay. We'll just give him a second. Mm -hmm. I have Deputy Mayor McManaman has returned. And I'm just looking for Councillor Strachan. Okay. No problem. I'm here. There she is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> It takes a little bit for me to scroll through. Council Berkeley, are you with us? There he is. He is there, just putting his ears in. Okay. I was chopping wood. <laughs> that's a that's a great way to use ten minutes. Clearly, <laughs> and you look no worse for wear. You must be getting cold. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll call the meeting uh, back to order. Uh, thank you uh, to presenters uh, who, who were who were waiting for us to return. Um, and I uh, will go right to presentation number seven, the Oxford uh, Mills Community Association. And I believe I am welcoming, I'm sorry, is it Janie Le Duc? Uh, yeah, Jenny Le Duc. Jenny, uh. okay, merci. <laughs> yeah, <me do. laughs> thank you, merci. Thank you. Um, Thank you for uh, allowing me the, the chance to, uh, to speak tonight and uh, present our, our request. Uh, my name is Jenny Ledzik. I am uh, representing the uh, Oxford Mills Community Association, uh, also known as the OMCA. I'm sure uh, a few of you are, are very familiar with our, our great uh, association. Uh, uh, for those of you who aren't, uh, we are comprised of uh, volunteers that uh, work together to plan, develop, and implement uh, all sorts of community events and, um, and, and programs. And uh, the, um, the nature of our, of our association is, is very event-driven. And as part of our yearly program, uh, we have a Canada Day celebration, which is uh, in fact a, a long-term uh, long time tradition in Oxford Mills. And, uh, and our request this, uh, uh, for, for, um, for the community fund is to help fund uh, this, uh, this great day that uh, we host every year. Um, and so uh, we are seeking uh, financial assistance in the amount of $1,000 just to, to help us fund uh, the day's event. Uh, the, um, uh, to make it a success, uh, uh, the, um, the event really relies on entertainment and that comes in uh, many forms so uh it comes in uh stage-based entertainment so music performers some bagpipers town crier uh it also comes in the form of interactive uh, entertainment so face painters uh we also have sword fighters we have uh, a a kids section where there's instructed led um uh, canada day themed crafts uh we're looking to do a boat race this year uh, so uh, lots of lots of components to this day. Uh, there's also, of course, some some food um, and um, and uh, just general uh, event supplies and services that uh, that are make make this event uh, happen. Part of which is uh, renting Maplewood Hall. Um, so um, in in regular years, uh, <laughs> we we do a lot of our of our funding through fundraising, uh, sponsorship, oh, yeah. such. And uh, because you know COVID, you know the uh, <laughs> the 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 nature of our fundraising has has um, has been a little bit more challenging because uh, of the, uh, the the restrictions restrictions on uh, just um, gathering gatherings themselves. So uh, we were uh, we're looking for um, for this uh, community grant to kind of uh, uh, help us uh, bridge that gap um, where. Uh, 
uh, we're able to, to host uh, the same quality of entertainment as we do every year uh, for this coming year. Uh, it's, a, it's a recurring event. So throughout the years, of course, uh, <laughs> um, your participation would be most welcome. Uh, but uh, we have been uh, self-sustainable for, for many years. Uh, and uh, th this is a nutshell, our, our, um, our, our, our proposal. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward request, so it's short and sweet, uh, <laughs> probably under five minutes. Uh, but of course, if you, uh, <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, and uh, we hope that you can uh, be a part of, uh, of, our, of our great day. Thank you. That was very efficient. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done. Uh, and I'm sure that the night is getting on for everyone. So I appreciate uh, your own need, I'm sure, for efficiency. Uh, so again, I guess in this case, uh, just to be clear, really the, the pandemic has compromised your uh, regular capacity to fundraise mm -hmm. and underwrite much of the costs uh, of this event yourselves. Uh, which has really brought you to, to ask for some obviously modest support in this case uh, to make sure that your event um, is a successful one in 2022. That's fundamentally the rationale. Apart, from, I've been to the Oxford Mills Canada Day event. It's outstanding. It's a, it's a fantastic space. Um, it's been a real treat when, uh, when my kids were younger in particular. It offers something very special and very unique in, in North Granville. So I'm, I'm glad to see you uh, bringing attention to it today. Um, so do you expect after this year that uh, you would be seeking additional support or do you really see this as an anomaly? I'm just curious. Well, I mean, our operating costs, obviously they go up every every year yeah. because of, of just general costs of, of, of uh, expenses going up. But uh, in the past, I mean, this is this is a, a first time request uh, on mm -hmm. uh, of this nature. And we, we do seek funding from uh, there's Heritage Canada that was, we were looking to get uh, some help on that front as well. So um, mo mostly we're, we're we, you know we try to to raise the funds ourselves, and we do mm -hmm. have uh, you know some very good sponsors that, that have helped us throughout the the years as well. And we're we're still going to seek that as well, but uh, we want to make sure that um, you know we're covered for this year, and 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 we basically don't have a you know. A, a, a magic ball to kind of know what's coming for the following year. So we do hope that we'll be able to kind of uh, self-sustain it in, in the future again, but um, uh, yeah. I guess we'll, uh, we'll cross that bridge when, when we get there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a fair answer. And I, I do reflect as you were presenting uh, that uh, obviously we do support Canada day celebrations in Riverside park, which are intended for everyone, but at the same time, I think it is important to recognize where other historic and significant Canada Day celebrations are occurring. So I, I'm, I, I feel glad that you brought this to our attention uh, tonight through the community grant process. Um, colleagues, any uh, questions? I'm not seeing any. I think we've all been there uh, on no, Canada Day. No questions and we from me. No all questions right. from me. Historically, we have granted to the OMCA. That's been in the range of $300 a year. And uh, uh, usually Canada Day is one of the OMCA's uh, better fundraising events. It's the largest event, but we also, but without being able to run it the way we have, not, well, we, they, <clears throat> uh, they have in the last couple of years, it, they've taken a hit in terms of uh, fundraising. So I think it's a reasonable request in mind. Yeah, opinion. yeah. Good, all right. Thank uh, you very well, much. Without further ado, <laughs> have a good evening and, and appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, take good care. Okay, uh, so then we'll move on. Uh, I believe we have Suzanne Lerner and Lisa Pushinsky. You're both here? Yep. Okay, uh, the Lantern Festival, <laughs> or the Lantern Parade rather. And I saw some gorgeous photos and I'm uh, regretting every minute of not being able to make uh, the, the, I think the inaugural edition or a pre-edition or a pilot edition of this a uh, lantern uh, parade, uh, so fire away. Great, thanks for having us here, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and speak about our event that we pretty much uh, launched a few days ago. And um, yeah, so we're presenting uh, today, we're talking to you today about the, the Twilux Lantern Parade. Um, it was listed a little bit differently on the agenda, but I just wanted to let everyone know that's what we're talking about today. Um, can we have the next slide, please? 
Hi folks, uh, so Suzanne and I are the co-creators and head lanterneers of this event, a brilliant event. My name is Lisa Pashinsky. Um, I'm a local artist, musician. I also do a lot of event coordinating and I'm director of Voyager Art Music School. I've hosted hundreds of performances across Canada through my record label. I'm a kinder music teacher and uh, I'm particularly interested in creating and animating family friendly programming, which is what the Twilux Parade allows me to do. And I'm Suzanne Lerner and I'm an active OMCA board member and community events builder and I live in Oxford Mills, but previously I uh, in another life, I lived in Prince Edward County and I was a co-creator for a festival that's going into its 10th year, which I actually participate in and, and, and build every year, a Lantern Festival that um, has grown to see up to a thousand people show up to every year. Um, and I am too also an artist and love community engaged events like these. Um, and I've participated and contributed to many of those over the years. Next slide, please. That's for you, Lisa. Ah, so what is the Twilight's Lantern Parade? It is a North Grenville Lantern Festival. It takes place when the days grow shorter and the starry nights grow longer. We parade from Crozier Park to Maplewood Park in Oxford Mills with handmade lanterns, illuminated costumes, light performers, and our neighbors to the wonderful sounds of a merry band of local musicians. At Maplewood, we encounter beautiful artist-built light installations, twinkling lights overhead in the heritage maple trees, more local music, refreshments, and more light performances. Next and slide. next slide, please. <laughs> So the next two slides are just a few pictures that we were able to capture from our event on Sunday, um, just to demonstrate the uh, smiling faces and the people who showed up, even though we had very minimal uh, media coverage and uh, we were really pressed for time to pull this together and we, we didn't um, we, we didn't advertise far and wide like we would like to in normal in normal times. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we ended up with the um over 200 plus attendees in the parade and close to 300 who joined on site, uh, which is pretty successful considering we didn't manage to promote it the way we would if we'd have more lead time. Um, so in this picture, you can see some children with lanterns. We managed to get uh, in touch with the um, Oxford on Rideau School and uh, they took us in to give workshops to their students. So many of the children that uh, were participated in the festival um, made lanterns with us as part of our workshops and um, as part of the way that we're planning on extending the scope of the festival we definitely want to do more workshops in the community but not just lantern making workshops we'd like to be able to include workshops um, so that the performers that we invite to the festival will be able to um, extend their experience to and connect with the local community so you can see katie guts on the left she was our fire spinner she was approached at the festival by someone to ask her about performing at our busker fest and uh, she's already uh, come to us to say that her favorite part of the festival was walking around and interacting with the children there and uh, showing them ways to use some of her equipment. So we're definitely going to organize workshops for Katie with the local dance and uh, gymnastic groups, as well as possibly schools. We'll see how that works out next year. Next slide, please. So really, um, the most important part of our, our, our festival and these kind of festivals is community engagement. Um, it's what makes this event really special or unique. Um, it's the key, and I, I like to call it the beating heart of the festival. Um, holding workshops in the, in the broad community, having workshops in schools and town halls and libraries, um, holding these festivals um, brings the sort of creativity to the community and engages them and, and makes the festival really their own. Um, it's uh, really important uh, to the success of the the, uh, the festival for us to engage in this way and to gather a lot of momentum by, um, um, like I said, like 
having having the community create and and then join in uh, the festival with their creativity and their creations so that they do feel like they've actually built the, the uh, festival themselves. Um, so yeah, Lisa already, she mentioned that we want to do more workshops. We have a lot of ideas to include more workshops and to, to broaden our scope. Um, I found in my past that uh, people think that this might be a festival for children, but usually my workshops are 50% adults. Uh, so that's pretty exciting that um, adults and children feel like they can, they can feel creative and, and, and magical in this sort of uh, uh, scenario. Um, each year we'll be hiring more and more artists and musicians to join in the fantastical light installations and, and music and hope to um, pay them all fair wage um, rates uh, as well as uh, contribute back to the local economy with, with the um, materials and the, um, the, the people that we hire to um, help us put this on. Next slide. Speaking of musicians, so we had uh, a local group um, play with us. It was, you can see them on the top left. One of them was my neighbor. I didn't even know she was a musician. So that was a fun find for me. It's the, um, the what was it? The Happy Kids? Shoot, the how did I forget that already? Thank you, The Grateful Kids. And um, uh, just to talk a little bit about fair trade pay scales. This is a new concept for me. Um, which is kind of strange because I've been hosting music concerts uh, for, you know, 20 years. <laughs> but uh, things have changed in the union and um, they have uh, become accessible for people who aren't just classical jazz and jazz performers to be able to participate. And um, they are trying to make uh, Canada basically into a tr fair trade venue and I'm hoping that we can start with Kempfell. So um, following fair trade is basically paying performance union rates and once the town gets that reputation not only um, do we draw musicians who are part of the union and that's usually musicians who are um, professionals uh, but we also can receive funding from the Musicians Association uh, for anything that has musicians performing um, that uh, doesn't include a ticket sale. So I'm definitely going to be looking for that to help us with the, the music aspect of this. And Suzanne, do you have more to say about that? No, we can go yeah. to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Okay, so... Um... This slide is really indicating where we got support from this year. Um, uh, so the top list uh, includes Oxford Mills Community Association, uh, Oxford Remedio School. We got community uh, donors to uh, anonymously donate generously to our event, as well as uh, we launched a GoFundMe to um, gather some more funds to be able to pay some musicians and performers, as well as our own contributions um, out of our own pockets. But this year um, we're seeking um, more funding, um, and this is why we're here today. We're hoping to uh, rely on the support of, of um, North Granville, Municipality of North Granville, but we're also um, casting our net a little wider into the Community Foundation, R209, and Provincial Arts Funding. But um, in order for us to um, capture the broader funding, it is really crucial that we show that we have municipal support and municipal funding secured um, so that they, uh, we, can, we can indicate that we do have the support locally and that this is uh, uh, a locally loved or appreciated festival. Yeah. Um, so I think we can talk a little bit about money now. So this year, uh, the entire cost for the festival was a little over two thousand dollars and uh, we managed to find that money through in-kind donations and um, through uh, GoFundMe community donors Oxford on Rito um, and the Oxford Mills Community Association volunteered uh, that we managed to do it, but I didn't quite get to the level of the of the fair trade uh, pay for our performers. Um, and next year, I I definitely have that as my as my main goal is anything that I run is going to be up to that level. Um, so we're asking for twice, of, like a little more than twice as much funding for next year, which would be around five thousand dollars. But again, we are approaching all of these uh, different places for us to get funding from and they will match 
a number of them will match 50-50. So our ask from uh, the municipality is basically whatever you can, <laughs> which will help us get money from outside sources as well. Um, and also, we just wanted to say that we are definitely interested in working with the municipality to make sure this works on a number of levels, including finding an appropriate date. So we had we had a bit of a struggle in November because we butted heads with the Santa Parade because they didn't actually post their date until two weeks before the Santa Parade. So we had our event at exactly the same time originally. So luckily we were able to move it to the next day. Uh, so I'm hoping that we'll get some help from Heather Curie, your, the tourism director and other folks in the municipality so that we can set up events in November so that they don't conflict. And it would be great if we could have a regular weekend that we could have it every year because this was just our first one. We want to do this uh, festival forever. <laughs> Next okay, slide, so, please. Yeah, next slide. Oh, I think maybe we're, uh, we wanted to just also, we did indicate that we had a lot of volunteers who helped and that helped us um, uh, put together this event on a shoestring budget. So thank you for the volunteers and we'll be relying on, on them next year as well, as well as gathering some more. Um, we did have a couple of um, uh, other community volunteers and a teenager who came to help out and uh, it's a great, wow. great fun way to gather their volunteer hours for sure. And next slide. Okay. And, uh... There we go. We love you, North Granville. <laughs> On November 21st, 21, we paraded with 200 people, saw close to 300 attendees at Maplewood Park. Residents of Brockville, Ottawa, Kingston, and North Granville were among the crowd. With additional preparation time and less restrictions, we plan on hosting a larger and more collaborative event in 2022. And uh, there we go. That's our presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, it looks like a really inspired evening. I know Councillor Sullivan was there and I think Councillor Brackley, you're all there and your hand is up. So I'll go to you. Uh, uh, thank you for that presentation, uh, Lisa and Suzanne. Uh, I, I hope other arts groups or any uh, nonprofit group is, are, are taking notes, especially during your presentation. Um, my comments earlier about uh, sustainability is really to the point that I think we want to see our dollars go as far as possible. And, and when you approach a uh, municipality for funding uh, to, to approach it as seed money, and as Lisa and Suzanne are taking uh, the attitude that this is money that they can leverage uh, to, to, to fund the rest of their festival and, and build on it. So I just wanted to make that comment. I thought it was a great presentation and hopefully other groups are taking notes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I also I also wanted to say that part of our funding will be going back to the municipality in, in rental fees and um, for our workshops, we're going to need spaces and obviously um, um, public spaces would be best suited to what we what we do as they're so accessible. So um, uh, part of our ask is for rental of um, spaces like Maplewood Hall or the municipal um, center for some space to hold workshops there, potentially library as well, although I know that they are a separate uh, entity, um, but I just wanted to make that clear that um, part of our ask is that sort of, that's where our money would be going to as well. So, excellent. And just, uh, just, just referencing the festival or the, the parade that recently happened, did residents have to, um, bring a lantern with them if they weren't able to do one beforehand or how did people participate in the absence of having that time or capacity to make their own lantern? Did, were you making lanterns on site as well? We, well, we had, so we had classes at Oxford and Rideau yep. and we also had a Zoom. Uh, we had a virtual oh. workshop. Okay. Yeah, Lisa led that one. So there were um, families who made lanterns that way. We also, um, because we were short in time, I did have a pre-made video. So we had videos that we were sharing with everyone. So and people did show up having made them themselves. Mm -hmm. People did also show up having made ones out of their own imagination without mm -hmm. knowing how to make one, mm -hmm. or they brought lanterns that were from their home, like 
uh, pre-made bought lanterns they just grabbed from their front porch. Um, and then of <laughs> course, everybody dressed up and put on lights and things. But okay. next year we'll see more of that because the more it snowballs and with there's more and more workshops, more people will show up with their, with their, with their creations. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you mentioned a, a lantern festival that you uh, helped to build in Prince Edward County. Um, mm -hmm. which I think uh, is still going from what I understand. And, yeah. and just quickly, how did, how did that evolve uh, in a similar way in terms of? Very similar way yeah. in that I had um, in my travel scene, lantern festivals and really desperately wanted to bring it to my municipality where I was living. And it was difficult for me to find someone to partner with because doing it alone is a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. And I finally found somebody and mm -hmm. I partnered with her and the two of us were just an unstoppable force. And next year will be the 10th year. Um, and at some point we did end up partnering with the, with the municipality and it became, um, it became kind of a municipal event and, mm. um, and, uh, yeah, it's still going. It's, it's so much bigger than when we first started for sure. Uh, well, it looks like a really inspired night and I was in a hockey arena <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> with kids, but, uh, next year, next year, I will be clearing, I'll be clearing the deck. Uh, I just wanted possible. to add one more thing about about our actual submitted application. Mm -hmm. I submitted um, a different amount for each year over the next five years. Those are not asks from the municipality. That's just an estimate of how big the it's going to become. And then on year five, I, I just basically submitted what year five was for the Picton Festival. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so that was up to about seventeen thousand dollars. I'm not expecting that from you guys. I was just uh, giving you what the gross hopefully is going to be as we expand. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I so don't. Much. I don't see any uh, other questions. So thank you both. Thank thanks uh, for your efforts to pilot it in Oxford Mills, a, a really beautiful event. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay. So we are down to our last uh, two, and I have the pleasure to welcome Julia O'Grady. I think she's with us in regards to the Here. yoga festival. Hi. How is everyone? Glad to see you. Um, so um, I won't, I'm not gonna go through every slide because we ran this event last year and some of the information is duplicate. Um, there are a few things I'd like to cover specifically. So if I can get the next slide, please. So just a quick overview, uh, over 15 classes. This year we actually had 21 classes um, that started at sunrise and we went till past dark. Uh, it was on the Kempel campus and we had 107 attendees. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so based on who attended this year, we can tell you that the attendees at our event will be women aged between 45 and 54 with a household income of 100 to 150,000. Uh, these people spend three to five hours a week on self-care and live within 50 kilometers of North Grenville. I was actually super pleased to see our stats come through that actually 60% of our attendees uh, were tourists coming from outside of, outside of the area, um, which I think is really great for the municipality and being able to get people into our community. And we had 11% of that were over hundred kilometers away. Next slide, please. So um, as I talked about last year, I really wanted to up the game on our event um, and do something that North Grenville had never had before. And we used an event app this year for the event, which was a great success. We had 67% of the people register on the app and people loved that they were able to follow along, plan their day, choose what sessions they wanted to attend. And uh, we limited the amount of paper being uh, printed. We didn't have you know, stacks and stacks of schedules and stuff around for everyone to use. And that ended up in the garbage afterwards, which is really great. Um, page views on the app, 7,631. Next slide, please. Uh, impressions reached through the app, 8,764. And then impressions reached through social media were over 25,000. The, um, the best thing about the app, and the reason I'm going to talk about it is because it's in my, our ask again this year, is that we use the app to promote uh, local businesses as well as um, local events. Um, the um, Frisbee that presented earlier today, the Frisbee uh, golf that presented today, we, 
we promoted that in the Ferguson Forest Center. We promoted one of the fundraisers that was going on in town. So we went through and, you know, like kept an eye on what was going on in the municipality and sent out notifications and stuff without any ask for funds or anything from any of the groups that were involved in those events. We just helped to promote it through the app. Next slide, please. So our ask this year is bigger than last year by quite a bit, but I also would like to ask council to keep in mind that last year we were running on a um, limited expectation for the event because we were in the middle of COVID and had no idea what this was going to look like. So I do think that the ask this year is very similar to what it would have been last year if we'd been running on a more normal year. Um, so we would like to get a website this year. Um, we used social media specifically last year along with the app. So we have a local, um, not a, I want to call her a student because she's the same age as my daughter. So it feels like she's tiny, um, but she is a now young, successful businesswoman. Um, and she will, um, I've spoken with her about developing our website for us. We'd like to bring the event app back again this year because we've already built so much content into it. I would love to see that repeated and then we can continue to grow it. Um, the cost has gone up on the app and I do believe that um, the event app developers, because I have used their app in the past for my own business, um, for my clients, sorry if you can hear my dog snoring in the background. Um, I have used them for other events, conferences and things that they did give me a deal based on the budget I had last year. So this year, this is the actual cost of the app. We would like to join the Festival and Events Ontario um, group and become a member there so that they can help us promote the event far beyond our, our reach. Next slide, please. Um, Audiovisual, our costs will have to go up based on feedback that we got this year that there was some difficulty with the uh, being outdoors and doing like microphones and it was windy and you know just those logistics of uh, doing an outside event. And also, we do expect the event to grow. So this year, for those of you who were there, we had three classes set up side by side, and there was some noise bleed between the, between the classes. So we, we will need to separate that. So that one space where we were this year in behind WB George will be one classroom, and then we expect to move to a second and potentially third location on the campus. Um, venue rental for the campus, I'm estimating at 2000 We got a great price on it this year. Um, I am a little bit concerned that we may not get the same price next year, just because I think we caught them a bit off guard because we asked for a piece of property that they had never rented before. So I'm worried that now that we've rented it once, that they're going to see that as a valuable asset and potentially raise the price. So I've estimated a little high on here on what this is going to look like for um, space. The WV George Center was the perfect location for us, uh, having access to the bathrooms and refillable water station was like exactly what we needed. So it was a huge help for us. And then the signage, I'd like to draw special attention to the signage because this is not about our festival in particular. What I would actually love to do, being an event specialist that I am, I would really love to um, commit this money to not just for, this, for the yoga festival, but to actually help create proper signage for the campus for when it comes to events that are going to be held on the campus. The campus is not an easy um, piece of property to maneuver if you're not familiar with it. And even if you are familiar with it, um, I've been there a million times and yet I still could not tell you how to get to one building without having to drive down seven streets first. So um, I would really love to be able to offer my expertise and invest in proper signage that the college staff can put out or that they can lend to the people doing the events and then they can put out themselves to direct people to um, event spaces. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So our total ask is 19,620. Um, it hits, our festival hits many of the municipalities goals uh, for, um, Sorry, I'm forgetting the word that you used on your website. Um, but we are showcasing a healthy lifestyle, which I think is, um, which I've always wanted North Granville to promote because I think we have such an asset there to be able to do that. Um, we're promoting mental and physical health and physical healing, sorry, uh, following a challenging time globally, uh, creating a sense of community among local businesses and residents, and then helping to create an event friendly atmosphere on the Kento campus. That is all. I am available for questions.
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and I know I had an opportunity to be there as did Councillor Strachan. So I'll go to Councillor Strachan first and I'll put myself on the list uh, afterwards. Go ahead, Councillor Strachan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Julia, for the presentation. I think it was a, a wonderful festival. I loved uh, participating in it. It was a wonderful day. It was a really great um, sense of community. I know that uh, the young volunteers that you had there uh, appreciated coming together and uh, learning more um, behind the scenes, the technical side of things. They saw all of that. Uh, the signage piece, um, yeah, it's pretty awful. I mean, I know the campus really well, um, but uh, uh, you, know, you, you leverage having catered affairs, um, you know, available for lunch and so on. And it was wonderful. But as I was walking to and from, there were tons of people who had no idea what was going on um, and how to even find catered affairs. And it's, you know, you can almost see it uh, from the WB George, but if you don't know what you're looking for, there's no way you'll find it. So um, hopefully the point about signage isn't something that you have to have uh, in your budget, that it is something that can be um, created uh, in order to facilitate future events and just general um, uh, access uh, to parts of the campus so that people know where they're going. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's a lofty, um, fairly big ask, uh, I think, um, but I, I, you know, I saw the potential this year and um, there's definitely ways I think that, um, you know, it connects, like you said, uh, so many different parts of what we've, um, you know, stated as important values in this community. Um, the, from everything from the, the active and fitness aspect of things to the community building and so on. I'm wondering, um, you know, because it is a large ask, if you didn't get the full amount, um, does this just become a smaller festival or do you have um, other ideas in mind about where you could access other funds? Um, um, I, I know there were tickets sold obviously to, um, to attend in this, uh, in this event. So is there any space for, you know, um, not that I wanna pay more next year, but <laughs> for making <laughs> tickets more expensive or just finding other uh, funding uh, sources for this because um, I, th I think it has potential. So those are my questions. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yes, it is a big ask and I'm aware of that. And I figure the worst you're gonna say is no. So I have, there is no harm in asking. And um, our expenses are quite high for a festival, for anyone who's run a, fe a festival. It looks simple when you look at it. It's, you know, it's a bunch of people on yoga mats in the middle of the grass, but there's a lot of um, PPE issues we had to deal with last minute. Um, next year, we're gonna need to do fencing. And, you know, like we really um, kind of dumbed it down this year to really keep it simple for one, my own mental health, to keep it easy because of everything else that was going on. But um, just because we just didn't know what was coming, right? So th this coming year, now that we are headed outside of this COVID world, um, we have to look at this as a festival pre-COVID and what people will expect. And especially if we're going to have people traveling to the municipality to attend an event, their expectations are high because if they're coming from the city, they're used to city level festivals. So if we want to be able to maintain that, we're going to have to continue that. Um, if we don't get the funding, um, it will just limit what we're going to have to do. We're just going to have to pick and choose. And so like, it may be that we don't do the website this year and we continue with the app or, you know, like it's just, it's going to be just weighing options and weighing out what's necessary versus what we, you know, what we think we can do without this year. And then in hopes that next year, and then obviously I'm just waiting for the announcements to come out for any other festival funding to see what that's going to look like. Um, this year, I know they did a little bit last year and we're hoping in the events industry that they're coming out big this year because we know that they weren't able to distribute all the funds that they were hoping to last year. So hopefully they'll have a little bit more in their pockets um, federally and provincially. Thank you. Okay. So Council Barclay and Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, it's obvious that uh, the depth of your experience and, and professionalism is clear in the presentation you made. And I, as I said, after the last presentation, I, I hope other groups are taking notes because one of the things that appeals uh, to uh, the council, uh, not only just the quality of the event and what it's about, but is the economic development uh, aspect of it. And I think the way you presented some of that engagement uh, data, I think is really valuable and uh, other people should be doing that as well because uh, it's not the sole reason, again, that we would pick and choose uh, the winners and losers as far as uh, community grants goes, but uh, definitely uh, we're keeping an eye on developing tourism in North Grenville, and uh, the economic uh, development data is, is valuable. 
Um, so thanks for that, uh, highlighting that aspect of your presentation. And uh, we'll see, uh, we've got some tough decisions to make uh, in close. So uh, best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Hi, Julia, thanks Hi. Uh, for this. Um, just a couple of finance questions. It's typical for me, but um, we, I, I believe myself and maybe one or two other council colleagues were expecting some kind of financials from last year. I don't know if that's forthcoming or not, but I would say that to other uh, groups as well, that uh, we would like to, uh, you know, in confidence, of course, see some of the numbers uh, when we're supporting these things. And also, I think uh, Councillor Barkley brought up before, to, and, and again, uh, what he referenced to taking notes that um, a lot of, uh, we, we raised the community grant program quite a bit and, and made it more robust, but um, I think part of the, the idea was first off to help sustain very vulnerable type of organizations, but then when, but for other types of festivals and organizations and fairs, all, all these wonderful things that we, we were trying to give them seed money to get things started, but not to be, you know, ongoing. And I think that's the comment that uh, Councillor Barkley was probably getting at for a lot of, a lot of these organizations. So something to keep in mind. And I'd like to hear from you where, where you think this is going. You obviously got a lot of people, you mentioned the family incomes of people coming in are 100, 150,000, so they can afford some fees. I don't know what your fees are, but uh, those are some of the financial numbers we were hoping to uh, potentially see, especially when you come back a second for a second time. Um, that's really all I have right now. Great that you mentioned some economic development. Uh, that's always important. Hard to measure, totally get it. Um, but uh, anyways, so if you could just get, clarify the financial piece for us, thanks. Yep, I'm happy to provide any financials that you ask. I filled out everything on the forms that you guys are asking for. So I would recommend to council that if you guys are actually looking for more financial information that you maybe change those, the reporting that we have to do because we've, it asks specifically for certain things and does not leave room for other things. Like it asks specifically to, for us to report on what you funded and doesn't ask for general budget stuff. So I'm happy to send over everything we have. Um, but just so you know that your reporting stuff actually does not require that. Okay, um, I'll, I'll have to get clarification. Maybe Brad uh, uh, on the call here could clarify that because I thought uh, after the money was sent out, there may be some more information, but I could be wrong. I don't see everything, uh, but that was hopefully the intention. Brad, do you want to speak to that? Yes, I can speak to it. Uh, so we do ask for... Uh, overall information in terms of the budget and uh, the, the, the amounts provided. Um, I, I can follow up after this discussion uh, with, I'm sorry, who are we speaking with? Julia? Julia, yeah. And just, just clarify the, uh, the report requirements. Yeah, cool. so in your financial summary, uh, number 10, it says, please provide the following financial information specific to your grant request. Yes, which so, would... and that's fine. Uh, like I said, I'm happy to send over anything you want, um, mm -hmm. but just to make you guys aware that it's asking specifically for your grant money. And how they're used, yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so so Julie, uh, obviously a fantastic day. It was, it was great. I, I got to come in and out a little bit as you may or may not know, had the opportunity to teach a short class. I mean, how exceptionally fun for me and incredibly terrifying, but it was wonderful. And um, Shanti was uh, excellent and the lead uh, co-teacher. So, you know, clearly uh, from my perspective, uh, I saw lots of wonderful people from our community and people I'd never seen before really enjoying the day on the campus. So it, uh, I think uh, offered something particularly unique um, to North Grenville and, and beyond. I'm just wondering if that, uh, I guess to, um, somebody's point, if you feel that the price point for the festival, right, that I guess it was a $60 fee, I can't remember what the 40, 40. 40 the day yeah. pass, um, if you feel that that could be adjusted to sort of just assist in some of the revenue generation, I don't remember exactly what we gave you last year, but clearly those revenues from ticket sales also supported the festival operationally. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know what the balance is between what the municipality would be supporting um, in terms of uh, the festival and where ticket generation or other sponsors, you know, become part of the offset overall. So I, I don't have actually the 
through this presentation, I'm not sure if you've assigned a bigger number to what it actually costs um, to run the festival, apart from what you're asking the municipality to sponsor. I, no doubt, even with a, a pared down festival, there, there was certainly a lot of complexity, right? You were running three yoga classes basically simultaneously all day. <laughs> and there was lunch and logistics and, and many other elements, right? So it is complicated. I think you're correct. It looks simple, but actually there's so many underlying elements uh, that have to go very well for the festival to feel like a, a positive and, and seamless experience for participants. But do you have that breakdown in terms of, what the revenue offset was and what our you know municipal contributions were. Mm -hmm. Yep. So your contribution was seven thousand two hundred and thirty-two okay. dollars. Yeah. The total expenses for the event were just over twelve thousand. Okay. Um, and the and I don't think we can really raise the price like the ticket price. I think we 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 researched a lot of other yoga festivals that have happened over the last few years and really kind of positioned mm -hmm. ourselves perfectly, I think, in the market and what that looks like, where we're going to generate that is going to be the number of people attending. That's going to really be our focus. And that's where that income is going to be able to come from mm -hmm. as being able to just in, go with uh, quantity over, you know, raising our prices. Right. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. I think there's just a quick follow-up from Councillor Barkley. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's it's not directed to Julia. Uh, it's I think it's uh, opportune for me to mention that uh, Suzanne and, and Lisa will be aware of that because they're on the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee. But to Deputy Mayor's point about uh, we uh, the fact that we receive uh, requests for uh, basic uh, social services as well as you know artistic events, that uh, one of the things that's being discussed in the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee is a arts development fund. Mm -hmm. And I know there was money placed uh, in this year's budget um, and I don't know uh, to what extent uh, Director Brookman uh, knows about this, but uh, if he does, he, maybe he can speak to it. But I, I, this, it's, not it's not really applicable today uh, to these uh, deliberations and this intake, but I think next year we'll, we'll find uh, another avenue for uh, artistic events to find funding. Thanks. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so just, Julie, just going back to the previous question, do you think that the proportion um, ver the proportion of what the municipality contri would contribute versus what the uh, revenues through ticket sales would generate would be more or less the same this year, right? So it, a bigger ask, but proportionally, you're going to spend more on the festival. Is that the math that you've done more or less? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So costs are going up. You were just yeah, like we have to up the game this year. We cannot present the same festival that we did last year. Mm -hmm. It's not, in my opinion, not acceptable and not what people will be expecting. So we really need to up our game and, and the little things like um, paying our instructors this year. Mm -hmm. It's nice to I I don't like asking people to do things for free. And this year we asked nicely mm -hmm. that they come and help us for free. And I don't think that's a fair ask. So you know, we've got $2,000 in the budget to pay our instructors to spend the day there, you know, mm. instructing. And so just those costs, you know, as everyone knows, add up. We're right now, my anticipated budget is uh, approximately $30,000 to run the event this year, which okay. is consistent with other festivals that I've run in the past as well. It's, you know, I don't think there's any surprises in the budget. Okay. Right. Okay. So it's scale, really. It's scale and yep. improvements. Correct. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, colleagues, anything else? I know we're down to our last presentation after Julia. I don't see any other hands. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Julia. I know you were at the end of this meeting, so a long wait, but super appreciate uh, you, you coming and giving us some good insight into this uh, recent festival and what you're hoping to do next year. Yeah, appreciate no it. Um, thank Jim, you. I'll send over the, um, the budget, the uh, two budgets last year's and this year's. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. All the best. Okay. So we're down to our last presentation. Thank you very much for your patience. Of course, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, you've already been here once. Uh, so here you are again. And I think you have two concepts uh, in addition to the Lantern Parade to present. Yeah. And I, I, I know that we're hoping to wrap up around 9.15. So Maybe we can do this last one in about 10 minutes, uh, but of course, 
Uh, if it takes a bit longer, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, I have kind of two five minute presentations back to back. I hope that's okay. Yeah, just go with it. And we'll okay. let you know when you're at the 10 minute mark. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I'm Lisa, you've met me already. And I'm back because I'm seeking funds for the Kempville Street Piano Concert Series. This is a project in partnership with the municipality of North Grenville under the advisory of the Kempville BIA. And it's a presentation in three parts. Uh, first is the installation and maintenance of a street piano in downtown Kempville. The second part is a 10 date outdoor free to the public summer concert series based around the street piano. And part three is um, the following indoor winter concert series that will take place at the Urbandale Arts Centre, and that is a ticketed series. Uh, next slide, please. Oh no, next slide. <laughs> who, does, uh, who does the slides? Halleck, Halleck, are you with us? Or <laughs> there we go. <laughs> It's the end. Oh, back. Back one. There we go. Thank you. Okay, why is street piano? Kempville is one of the fastest growing communities in the region with families looking for cultural experience. Street pianos draw pedestrians, turning any location into a concert venue and a cultural hub. By giving residents an instrument to play together, this project gives locals a chance to share their knowledge, initiate their own play, and create relationships, bringing life to public spaces and inviting foot traffic to downtown businesses. Next slide, please. About the summer concert series. So the street piano goes live in downtown Kempville with a concert in May 2022 at Buskerfest. In October, the piano then moves to an indoor location where residents may continue to tickle the keys and listen to other community members perform. Concerts in the summer series will take place twice a month, uh, leaving the street piano free for locals to book concerts for band rehearsals, music lessons, busking, independent concerts, birthday parties, etc. Interested parties may reserve the piano via an online calendar, which we can talk about later. It will be accessible for walk by traffic to play during the day at all other times. Now I'll be referring to the health unit for the latest safety protocols, including sanitizing wipes and hand sanitizer, which will be available for residents to use prior to playing the piano. Next slide, please. What locals have to say about the project. Now in my leaf application, um, locals were encouraged to leave comments in support of this project. So this is some of the comments that came from that project. Uh, my family moved here right in the middle of COVID, which limited our chances to meet the people of this wonderful community. This program would allow my family to become and feel part of the Kempville community and to ease us into returning to some normality, which is so vital to mental health. That's Sylvie Giroux, a parent. The street piano and the concert series will provide opportunities for the community to explore businesses and recreational amenities downtown. Councillor John Barkley. And whenever I'm visiting a town that has a street piano, I instantly love the place forever. We can and should be that place. It will bring out all the incredible musicians who live locally and can create a beautiful atmosphere in our community. I will definitely sing along. And that was Katie Nolan, parent, poet, and musician. Next slide, please. The emphasis on family-friendly programming in this series is unique. Uh, as a kindergarten, as a kinder music rhythm and movement teacher, that's me up there, I'll be there to help our musical acts engage audience members. Residents and musicians will spread the word and people will travel from Ottawa, Brockville and beyond to take part. With concerts complementing local events such as Busker Rest and the Farmer's Market, our visitors will partake of the best our area has to offer. Next slide, please. With so many families moving to North Granville, the demand for quality arts programming has never been higher. At present, the municipal master plan shows that, and I quote, 95% of respondents reported that their household goes outside of North Granville at least some of the time in order to meet their acts and cultural needs, to meet their arts and cultural needs. The plan recommends including the arts, culture, and heritage in our efforts to make a downtown 
a community focal point. This Street Piano Concert Series will address this lack by offering families interactive opportunities that take place in accessible locations for all our residents to enjoy. Next slide, please. How much? All parts of this project are scalable, which means that the project in some form may take place at less than the totals asked for in this presentation. The totals given are gross, meaning before other sources of funding. Other sources may include the Commonwealth LEAF Initiative, uh, which I'll find out about uh, by December 15th, whether I received that or not. The RT09 Partnership Fund, the Musicians Association and sponsorship from local businesses. Uh, the uh, like uh, was mentioned with the Twilux Festival, the RTO9 and Musicians Association funds are pre-existing matching funds, so they rely heavily on support from the municipality. So receiving funds, uh, any amount from the municipality, will not only support the project but encourage other agencies to invest in arts and culture in North Granville. So for the installation and maintenance of the street piano, the one time fee is uh, outdoor sound system, piano cover, payment to visual artist who paints the piano. That's around 3,300. A yearly expense for looking after the piano is going to come into around $1,900, which includes professional moving it and professional tuning it. So total for the first year for looking after the piano is $5,232, which will be less in the following years. So for the summer concert series, uh, next slide, please. At around $1,600 per concert, which includes um, paying the musicians, the sound person, some marketing, uh, a contractor fee, SOCAN fees, um, if you multiply this by 10, because I want this summer series to have 10 concerts, it's going to be $16,000. So first year total for both the street piano installation and care, plus the concert series is around $21,000. Next slide, please. Now moving summer locations may be as easy as wheeling it down the street, in which case it will be a lot less for moving fees. In 2023, it will probably reside in Riverside Park with the Municipal Centre lobby as a possible winter location. I'll be scouting out this year's summer location on Monday with uh, Tourism Coordinator Heather Curry, Municipal Rep Tammy Hur Hurlbert and the BIA's Darren Johnson. Next slide, please. The winter concert series is in the theater and it's no longer centered around the street piano, but the piano will still be accessible for the public to reserve and play at its winter location, which might look something like this. Okay, next slide, please. About the musicians. Hiring professional musicians for the free summer series allows residents to try out being part of a concert audience. All musicians take pleasure in both a unique performance, a performance opportunity, and fair trade payment. Uh, this is a picture of my friend Michael Holt. He's the definition of interactive musical programming. Next slide, please. Families who love the free summer series may transition seamlessly to the ticketed winter series. Uh, details to be determined. Again, this is a, another um, slide of musicians who would be able to fit both the summer or the winter series. Uh, next slide, please. The winter concert series, again, referring to the master plan, it's time to use our underutilized community assets, such as the Herbadale Arts Center. This is another nonprofit 10 day concert series, but it's ticketed and it takes place indoors at the Herbadale Arts Center. Again, in partnership with the municipality, um, specifically with Mark Guy and Lisa Camille in particular, running from November to March. To ensure family-friendly programming, most concerts will take place during the day on weekends. Ticket prices to be determined, but an example could be $30 per adult, $10 per child with a cap of 50 for a family with subsidized tickets available. We're at um, Oh, Sorry, okay. apologies. We're at ten minutes. Okay. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll just go to the next slide. Oh, there it is already. 
So I'll be reaching out to uh, the Ottawa Jazz Festival, Ottawa Chamber Fest, and various concert series in the greater area to discuss possible partnerships. But I just wanted to mention that um, piano players are gonna love having access to the grand piano at the Urbandale Arts Centre, which has been under a dust uh, cover for I don't know how many years now. It'll be great to be able to access that. And to be able to include indoor family-friendly programming during these concerts, there's probably going to be dancing in the aisles. I'll be coordinating with musicians to help them interact with their audience if they need help in a way that won't distract from their performance. So my summary for the Urbandale Arts Center. Let's see. That's one more slide. Next slide, please. Total for the Urbandale Arts Center. Um, it comes into around $2,300 per concert at the Urbandale Arts Centre. So for 10 concerts, that's around $23,000 for the entire series. Because it seats 300, um, the money that gets made from ticket sales will be able to go back to the municipality in form of forms of rental and insurance. Uh, if we get 76 adults in the crowd, 76 times 30, covers the cost of the concert. If we get 46 families in the crowd, 46 times $50 covers the entire concert. And I'm just gonna end with a local example. Um, back in the day when the Branch Restaurant had its own concert series, uh, Jim Bryson, an Ottawa favorite, came out to perform. He sold out at the Branch, $30 per ticket. And he would have easily filled a room of 300 people if, if we'd, had that happen at the Urbandale Arts Center. Um, so that's somebody, uh, that's an example of someone that who would fit perfectly into the winter series. Thank you for your patience, everybody. I'm open for questions. Once again, very inspired, Lisa, thank you. A lot, a lot there, no doubt. Um, can I clarify, so I understand you've made a grant application for the acquisition of an, a piano for the outdoor summer series. No, uh, actually, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to say getting the piano is easy. <laughs> it's not the but piano, it's, it's the, uh, the other elements. Is that correct? Yeah. The piano is free. Yes. Understood. Okay. Because there are a lot of pianos available. Is that, is that why? Yeah. Uh, but you made reference to a grand piano. In oh yes, the Grand so Piano, the Urbandale Arts Center. There is a Grand Piano in our yeah. Urbandale Arts Center. We are in possession of a Grand Piano at the Municipality. A beautiful, a beautiful Grand Piano that never gets played. Oh, one I have of, no idea. One of our many amazing local assets that we can use. Is it like Elton John worthy Grand Piano? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, so just to clarify, the components of the summer um, concert series are less the piano, more the logistics. Yeah. Uh, and whereas for the winter series, um, the fundamental costs really have, obviously we have the piano, news to me, I, I, I confess, no idea. So for the, the cost for the winter series are more use of the space. Is that correct? That's really... The big driver and the and of course uh paying the musicians yes so for for both series okay. whenever anybody uses a piano we have to tune the piano Understood. Uh, so that's for the actual booked professional concert series that will be part of the street piano official concert series but when when locals book the piano um they uh, they can also book a piano tuner, right? Like it's going to be interesting to develop the website in a way that uh, people can people can book their their different performances or their different uses of the piano. And uh, I mean, it's a way. It's it's actually a way for people who are breaking into the scene to be able to have a concert without having to pay a promoter or with a Anyway, it's it's uh, it'll be good for musicians who are up and coming and people who are just passing through. Okay, so really, it's it's in part, and I'll go to Council Barkley next. For both indoor and outdoor, you're suggesting that in part creating these kinds of spaces cultivate 
a sort of emerging musician community while also obviously giving residents in North Granville and beyond access to right a kind of musical experience right that otherwise you'd be traveling to Ottawa for or Kingston or Rockville right that's the whole point is to keep it in-house right absolutely and um just to make it a bit more interesting for families um I want to uh make sure that things are interactive so the idea of having a performance up on stage with everybody in the crowd and then you clap and you go home sometimes that's fantastic but it doesn't take much for for it to be more interactive even just having a 10 minute question and answer thing at the end or you know at the beginning um allowing students to uh, get up close to some of the instruments that are being performed it's a really a small thing, but that it could make a huge difference. So I'm I'm hoping to be able to do that in the winter and the summer series. Okay, uh, so I'll go to Councilor Barkley. Go ahead, Councilor Barkley. Yeah, I'll try and keep this brief because it seems like I'm on this uh, uh, training exercise where I'm encouraging everybody to listen to each other's presentation, take notes. Uh, I'll try and frame a question uh, around this comment. Uh, <laughs> What I like about your proposal, Lisa, is A, it's ambitious, and B, it's scalable, because you've uh, listed for the winter series and the summer series 10 events, and obviously people who are trying to get the biggest bang for their buck might be looking at uh, funding part of that rather than the whole series. So thank you for uh, laying out, uh, you know, the, 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 big, the big dream and... Uh, well, it remains to be seen where we land on it. Um, mm -hmm. It's also smart, uh, and I say this uh, for the sake of other people who are applying maybe next year, it's always smart, as you did, to quote uh, municipal policy uh, back to council <laughs> and how your project fits in. And uh, and without, <laughs> without saying much, quoting one of the councillors, I think that's probably pretty, <laughs> that pretty, make it cheap, easy pretty for cheeky you. of you. Yeah, <laughs> Let me make it easy for you to give me money. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's not, yeah. I've got one vote. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, so I'll go to Councilor Strahan. Go ahead, Councilor Strahan. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, very quickly, um, when we talk about which way this is scalable, um, which way would you see that if we looked at the overall ask and said, you know, we have to pick and choose and, you know, there's a lot of very good asks here this year and it would be great to support everybody, but I think uh, resources are finite, financial resources are even more finite than um, most others out there. So which way would you see um, this being scalable? Is it, you know, make everything smaller or is it, you know, focus on one, you know, aspect of the overall program, um, uh, you know, not to situate the estimate or anything like that, but just to, you know, get a sense of how you could see this rolling out with your vision in mind. Um, well, for both of them, I definitely uh, provided my, you know, wish list, right? My top wish list. So I do have places where I can cut and still be able to provide the programming. So for the summer series, um, I could cut out a sound person and try and do that myself uh, because that kind of uh, last minute outdoor concert is something that, that I specialize in, but it would be nicer if I could hire a sound person. Uh, for the Urbandale Arts Center, um, that one, I think the ticket prices that I've been thinking about are pretty reasonable. Um, if I get a lot of help um, with the, the social media part of it and advertising it, I see no reason why I can't get those ticket sales. And those ticket sales will actually cover the cost of the, the event. So asking for the money to cover the entire series is basically assuming that it's a fail, but I still want to pay everybody that was involved. So uh, half for the Urbandale Arts Center and anything that's made on top of that gets saved for next year. And then something similar for the summer series. Uh, after talking to the Musicians Union, um, there's a really good chance that I'll be able to get half of um, what the payout is for the musicians and for the contractor from the musicians union. So right there, that's again, something that we could, we could scale down to for half. And um, I've had some people volunteer to tune the street piano, but uh, that might not be great. Again, 
better service means more money. We'll see. Uh, but I'm really, you know, the time is this year. The street piano is going to happen this year, and the other stuff is icing on the cake. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I, I appreciate, because you've mentioned in previous presentations, and I, I heard that in the Soraya Festival one as well, is, you know, making sure that performers and instructors and so on are paid. Uh, I, I think that is very important, and I'm glad that um, uh, both uh, your presentations as well as um, uh, Julius have highlighted that, and I think uh, also the um, the poetry festival as well. So, like I, the arts fest, I think it I think it is important, and so I don't want to. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that you start uh, cutting based on you know finding volunteers to do everything that would normally be a a, a paid role. So, um, thank you very much for highlighting that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, colleagues? Uh, Lisa, we're we're blessed to have someone with your creative energy and your capacity to really visualize, right, um, uh, what some of these uh, events or series could look like uh, on an ongoing basis. I, I hear what you're saying about North Granville being on the cusp of, of, of something really great. And I know there is a burgeoning arts community here. It just needs a bit of TLC and um, some oxygen, right, to really take off. So I, I recognize, um, the strategic value of what you're putting on the table here. So thank you. Thank you for um, really thinking it through. We appreciate that. Just a little tuning, just needs a little tuning. A little tuning is probably true. Uh, well, you know, North Granville has a reputation for, be, for being Canada's most active community. Why can't it be, have an equal reputation to be a flourishing artistic, right? And music hub. <laughs> uh, it, it does have elements of that reputation already. So I. I can see your your want, and Ashley is still with us, right, as well. Um, the collective want to kind of leverage some of those arts moments, uh, which really do contribute to quality of life, et cetera. But as Councillor Strachan said, uh, yes, financial resources are particularly finite. So we'll be working our way through these to figure out what makes sense. Okay, colleagues, I think that brings us uh, very near the end of this evening. Uh, I don't uh, see anyone else on the agenda. I'm... Um, Going to ask for a move and a seconder that council receive the committee grant um, presentations this evening or requests, I should say. A move and a seconder, please. Uh, Councillor uh, Sarkian and Deputy Mayor, thank you. I'll call the question on that. All in favor? Thank you. Good. Uh, and I think we'll just move quickly to um, any questions from members of our community or the media, um, Heather? I confirm that we have none, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. So I'll go to confirmation bylaw. Uh, Councillor Barkley, would you like to move confirmation bylaw, please? I'll look for a seconder, thanks. Deputy Mayor, thank you. I'll call the question, all in favor? Good. And then we'll go straight to adjournment. Um, I will look for a mover to adjourn. Who would like to move to adjourn? Councillor Strachan, Councillor Barkley, thank you. And we will move to adjourn at 9.29 uh, p.m. Uh, thank you uh, to staff who've been here two nights in a row, uh, particularly late. Uh, so thank you, Ms. Babcock Cormier. I know you've done a ton of work here. Uh, Mr. Brookman as well. I appreciate your efforts. And Palak, um, uh, thank you for making sure this all gets on the right uh, social media channels, et cetera. All the best, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.